Note, unfortunately, we experienced some audio issues during the recording of this podcast. We have done our best to correct them, but a few persist. Our guests today are also joining us from their homes, so you're going to hear a train or two in the background. We here at Love Where You Live are all about keeping it real. Enjoy the podcast. It's an important one. Love Where You Live is brought to you by Live Love Local Michigan, the online and print magazine celebrating Michigan through amazing adventures, stunning photography, high-profile content, and more. Subscribe to our monthly print magazine for exclusive content you won't find on our free online magazine. With your subscription, you also receive automatic entry into our monthly subscriber Spend Local Michigan and surprise pop-up giveaways with prizes so magical, you'll think you found a pot of gold at the end of a Michigan rainbow. Subscribe online at livelovelocalmi.com. The Flint, Michigan sit-down strike as referenced by the Library of Congress. Once called the strike heard around the world, the first major labor dispute in the U.S. auto industry ended after General Motors signed a contract with the United Auto Workers Union on February 11, 1937. In 1935, the average auto worker took home about $900 a year, while the United States government determined that an annual income of $1,600 was the minimum on which a family of four could live in the year of 1935. In addition, working conditions were often difficult and unionizing efforts were resisted by companies. For example, General Motors spent $839,000, almost $1 million, on detective work in 1934 alone and used a group called the Black Legion who employed various intimidation tactics against active union members. As a consequence of these policies, Union organizers changed tactics, and gradually the union gained strength. In July of 1936, there were hundreds of deaths in the auto plants in Michigan that were thought to be a result of a heat wave combined with difficult working conditions. On November 12, 1936, three welders participated in a quickie sit-down strike and were fired when they arrived to work the next day. Their firing resulted in a sit-down protest of 700 men on November 13th at the Fisher Body No. 1 plant until the three men were rehired later that day. This success had an electrifying effect on Flint's auto workers and saw United Automobile Workers Union membership grow from approximately 150 to 1,500. On December 30th, 1936, General Motors workers started their sit-down strike, which at the time was legal, gaining control of the body plant number one in Flint. On January 1st, 1937, workers controlled a second plant in Flint. Although the strike was gaining power, some of General Motors' plants were still running, and most notably the Chevy plant number four, which was the largest plant owned by GM at the time. On February 1st, 1937, the striking workers took control of that plant as well. By remaining inside the plant, strikers were protected from both violence and weather, as well as from the threat of being replaced by other workers unwilling to go along with the strike. Inside the plant, the strike workers were playing board games, organizing concerts, giving lectures. Outside, union supporters arranged for food to be delivered to the strikers. And after 44 days of striking, GM president at the time, Alfred P. Sloan, announced a $25 million wage increase to workers and recognition of the union. This was the first major victory for unionization in America's history, and its consequences were dramatic. Within two weeks, 87 sit-down strikes started in Detroit alone. Packard, Goodyear, and Goodrich announced immediate wage increases, and within a year, membership in United Auto Workers grew from 30,000 to 500,000, and wages for auto workers increased by as much as 300%. This strike marked the beginning of decades of intense union activity. So today I have two guests that are both uh, members of the UAW. I'm going to have them introduce themselves and give a brief background. 
background about themselves, and then we'll move into the conversation. Michelle, introduce yourself and let us know a little bit about who you are. Hi, my name is Michelle. I um, am local 362 here in Bay City by way of local 1112 uh, from Lordstown, Ohio. I started with General Motors in 2001 as a temp for six years on my seventh year temporary service. They hired me on. So from 2008 to today, I got 15 years and um, I made the move to Bay City about four years ago when they closed the Lordstown plant. Okay. And our other guest is Chris Facundo. Chris, tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, my name is Chris Facundo. I'm from Local 362 up here in Bay City, Michigan. Started out in 1999 as an apprentice, uh, hired right off the street, and I made my way as basic a machine repairman, machinist. Been doing this for about 25 years now. I'm now currently on the bargaining team full time. I was an alternate also for six years. So I'm, I'm real happy that you invited us both Michelle and I, to give our story, and that's where I'm at right now. Absolutely. There's a lot of public misconception about the UAW, the current strike, and just in general about the positions of workers at UAW. So in this podcast, we're really going to talk about that information and dispel some of the quote-unquote so-called rumors out there. Chris, give us a little bit of a summary of where we currently are and what got us here with the strike. So in 2007, we had the, they say, the Great Recession when all the big three had some issues financially and they went to the government and asked for that big old loan that we had heard about. And we had to give up quite a few things during that time. And what occurred was we had contractual language that had, and we'll, we'll get into that. I'll tell you a little bit about, about that little in a second here. We had contractual language with our concessions, with all these nice benefits and, and things of that nature that, that the UAW had fought for us in so many years prior that our membership and our negotiators, we had to give up a lot to re get a loan, to receive a loan from the government before they, they would give us that money to get us out of this big hole hole that they want they were pointing the finger at the UAW worker saying we were the cause of this humongous recession because we're overpaid or we have uh, too good of insurance or and, and, it, and it lists and go on and on and we we agreed to it to just stay alive we wanted to keep America rolling we want to keep that American economy going a lot of people think that it was just to keep us, but we actually had to keep America going, you know, including up here in Bay City, all the way down to Detroit, all the way down to Ohio. And uh, they, they kind of forced us into a lot of different things. And that was just so we could keep our jobs. And like I said, it's just, that's when it first started. And after we got out of it, once we paid that loan back in full to the government, we never really got anything back from it. It was very, very minimal. It was like they were just keeping us quiet in a sense where we would say, okay, well, that sounds good. You know, like dangle a carrot. And everybody would say, well, okay, well, that's a decent enough contract. Well, we've been asking for raises for years and, and, and our wages to go up. And if I think I, I posted on my Facebook, uh, an agreement, our local agreement from way back in 2007 to 2019. I don't know about you, but a three dollar rate a wage increase from that point to this point in 16 years that doesn't sound much of a, a real big difference with the cost of inflation and the amount of money that they're making on vehicles, the profits they continue to make. Um, now, granted, we do get profit sharing, but that profit sharing formula was actually it finally got changed and I believe it was 2019 to where we got a little bit better profit sharing check but prior to that, that there was a formula that didn't we nobody could make sense of so we started using a different type of formula that made sense where people could understand it and it was much more easier to comprehend and accept but it still didn't coincide with the profits 
uh, and the wages that they were getting compared to our wages. And we're just asking for a fair uh, wage increase. I don't think uh, what Sean Fain is asking for is is astronomical. I think there is a way that they could beat in the middle. I don't think we need to be at 46%. I know I'm probably going to get beat up on that one. But I think there is there is a minimum threshold that we, I'm sure we can get to, to where everyone will be happy. It's just a matter of them actually saying, okay, we're okay with that. I think we could take this to the membership, but we're not there yet. There's a lot that we're trying to achieve. And, that, you know, when we talked about the, the bailout, the bailout was huge. We lost so much. We lost jobs, even right here at the local yeah. level. And, yeah, explain some of the concessions that you all gave oh in 2007. Um, the wages, we we took a freeze on wages. That was huge. We lost. We, we weren't in any wage increase. We lost COLA, which is the cost of living adjustment, which you hear quite a bit about. And that would accumulate over time, you know, over a year, you know, that would just stay on top of a wage. One year, you may not receive any COLA or you might receive a minimal amount. But that was okay because you were staying within what the economy is saying that we should have. And then some of the years if inflation grew, our COLA would be higher. And that would be on top of our wage. Uh, holidays, I was just explaining to Michelle about July 4th holiday. When I first hired, I was very fortunate that I was hired under a contract in which we would get July 4th week. It was July shutdown. That's what it was called for changeover. Where skilled trades and some production would work with us and we would do a changeover for vehicles. And we would come in. They would ask us, can you work? shutdown week and them and many of us did because it was a it was a high paying week well unfortunately they decided well too many gm employees are working so you no longer need that shutdown week so that was taken away and now we get one day off july 4th um they said we you know the percentage we have that of the back sat up and unfortunately that's how that happened with our, our holidays but the right to strike was huge when the bailout happened we weren't allowed to strike, and we didn't get back that back. And think after 2011 or 12, I believe, I might be. I'm not sure about that data, but I know we had to wait. The right to strike. The right to strike. We weren't allowed to 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 do what we're doing right now. We we were. The government put that stipulation to make sure that that they were going to get their money back in a sense. So we weren't allowed to strike. When I talk about jobs, how many jobs were lost, and just in here at our plant in Bay City, when I hired in, there was a little over, I want to say 13, 1,400 people. We are currently at around 300. That is a humongous decrease. And, and I think people, when like you and I were growing up here in Bay City here, you could go to that parking lot and it was full. Now you go to that parking yeah. lot, it's just, it, it's kind of, depressing in a sense, knowing that I grew up right here in Bay City and we have that little of people. But that just didn't happen here in Bay City. That happened everywhere. Buick City is another one and, and Morristown where Michelle came from. There was 145,000 GM UAW representative hourly members in 99 and it won 2000. Now we're down to around 45,000 and that is sickening. It is, it's just real depressing and, we, and people are wondering why we are fighting. And when you talk about jobs, we had several different types of jobs. And what GM, they, they always point the finger of, okay, well, where's our cost at? You have what's called direct and indirect labor. Direct labor is your production workers, the actual person that touches that part, you know, that's making that part and it goes out the, the door. The people that are indirect labor are people like me. My job is a machine repair machinist. They call it indirect labor. My, it's a, I'm a non-value added job to that part. Even though we fix the machines that make this quality part, even though the electricians will go in there and get that machine running from a computerized point of view, you know, ag coal repair. I mean, we have several different positions that were 99 that were there that they said, well, we don't need these jobs or we're going to combine these jobs. That's, that's the, the, the greatest quote of ever is the combination of jobs. Uh, we had this with this trades. They combined a lot of trades jobs within the trade and production jobs even. 
do they were now they were forced to do jobs that were now combined into their job and so we just kept on taking on more tasks after task after task after task because they said well I'm getting less money <laughs> yeah and it's just crazy it's just you know and you know for the record our local management here in bay city we're very fortunate to i'm very i'm fortunate to be on the committee the bargaining committee to work with them because they are not at the level to do what's happening in detroit right now they're at a local level and so they are they don't get to do the negotiating we're just trying to stay alive up here in bay city basically and and keep people working that's my job is to keep michelle working along with all the districts that i represent and their job is just to keep parts coming out the door without any disruption from us. So we work together and that's what, that's what this local management. So for the record, we have a very good relationship with our local management. So our fight is down there between the head honchos on both sides of the house. So we, I just want to make that real clear. So it's just a lot of, um, the way that we lost a lot of our work is through the combination of all the different jobs that we used to have in trades alone. We had 20 different trades. We're down to five, you know. Yeah, that goes back to that just-in-time manufacturing where these automakers used to make everything in-house. And now they, and we talked about that in a previous, I talked about that in a previous podcast with my brother who has worked uh, worked for over 10 years in the logistical side with some, with some, uh, some of the direct suppliers of the big three. And it's the just-in-time manufacturing that they adopted where all of these products and pieces to the car used to be made in-house by General Motors, by Stellantis, Chrysler back in the day, by Ford. And now they outsource all of those to multiple, multiple companies, which has taken all of these jo union jobs away and have replaced them with mostly non-union jobs. And yet the cost of vehicles is an average of $46,200 today as we speak. And they're blaming your wages as a part of that when it absolutely has nothing to do with it. It's laughable. So we just have nothing to do with the cost of a vehicle. I mean, I would, I would somewhat agree maybe back in 1999 when I first started, but presently, oh, oh no, I would 100% disagree because a 3% increase in wage over the past, what, 16 years is a joke, you know? I laugh at it. That's 20 cents a year. I, I challenge anybody, how long would you stay? And a lot of us, like myself, I'm one of the few fortunate ones that are going to get a pension when I get out of General Motors. And there are some that aren't getting nothing. They're going to get their whatever they decide to put in, and that's going to be Michelle. It's what they decide to put in with their wage, and they'll match it, you know, and, they, and they need, they're hoping that the stock market continues to grow. And we continue to do good on our stock market so we can put money away in our big nest egg. That's what we're hoping. That's what they're hoping for. Uh, where I get my pension, I'm guaranteeing my pension now that I'm busted. I'm, I'm the, one of the lucky ones. I'm one of the few lucky ones. But that's, you know, yeah, they like to blame. They want to place the blame game. And uh, I know I hear this a lot from someone very close to me. You know, they're pointing the finger at somebody at the UAW, but they got three pointed back at them. You know, <laughs> they don't look at look at it from that point of view. Right. I did some, some, it was very interesting. I did my own, I've been doing some different things. And in April of just this past year, we said, okay, well, are, are we really to blame? Is the hourly worker to blame? We have 53,000 uh, salary members right now. Salary. We have 40. We, Executives, managers. This is, this is all across in the United States, North America. Okay, we had 58,000. And they said, well, we need to hurry up and decrease this. We have too many managers. So we're going to offer 5,000 people. To, we're going to give them a nice severance package because we have to reduce yeah. them. I, I, I love the severance package. I've heard it um, many times before. And we got to do it this year before the contract because, you know, we have to show that we're we're going to bring our people down too and show that we've done cuts. So the UAW needs to agree with us too. And this happens. I mean, I could, I could tell you exactly. I, I was telling people that got hired in, they're going to start cutting people again. They're going to do it somewhere. They're always do it during contract year. 
GM hourly, our UAW workers, we got 42,300. Uh, so you have 53,000 chiefs and we have 42,300 Indians. Does that make sense? You know, so I, I, I kind of challenged Mary Bear on a lot of them things. So whose wage are you paying? You know, who's, who's really the person that we should be looking at? I challenge her to say, okay, well, the burden isn't the people that are making the product, you know, and that's people like Michelle, people like myself, you know, we're, we're there 40 plus hours a week. We're mandatory six days a week in an assembly plant. They're mandatory seven days a week. Nobody talk, yeah, nobody talks about that. It's kind of hush hush. And, uh, and, and. Yeah, it's it's great when you first get hired in there six, seven days a week, you see a pretty nice paycheck, but then you're away from your family. You know, the last time I looked, I, I, I don't see a lot of the executives in the plant on a Sunday on Mother's Day or Father's Day, you know. Well, how many, how many consecutive days are people working then if there's a seven day mandatory? Are, are we seriously saying they work every damn day and they get two weeks of vacation? They get, they, they work seven days a week. I mean, on, in our plant, we're very fortunate. We are. And, and that's why I, I, I go on record in saying we are very fortunate to have the management that we work with because they, they continue to work with a lot of us, a lot of our families, a lot of our members. And making sure that we get time off to do different things, we are very fortunate. But in, in assembly plants, it's a whole different ball game. Uh, the people that are working down in, in Flint and, and where Lordstown was, Michelle, I know she used to work six, seven days a week. They're mandatory. And in order for them to get any time off, they had to have it planned. Then it had to be authorized. Then they had to make sure they had people there that would do it. If not, their vacation could get canceled. I've heard of that happen. How is that? How is that legal? How is that legal? That's that's called uh, contractual employment. That's under our union contract. That's uh, GM protects them. They protect themselves, you know. And unfortunately, there are some times when when you have a union that has became more weak because there's not enough members. We don't have enough people to to stand up and fight like they're doing right now. This is what happens, and that's what Sean Fain, along with our international bargaining team, is doing. And they're doing a, 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 a very awesome job at, at getting people to be and be more involved and understand that we're trying to rebuild that middle class. We're trying to bring back those high-paying, or I wouldn't even say high-paying, decent-paying middle-class jobs. Because it takes a good job to have a house, to have a car. To, to pay your kids medical bills, to, to have them even go to school now. Um, Just basic, basic living experiences. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's, and, and that's where we're at right now. I mean. Finish explaining that because um, we had this conversation off camera or off a podcast where they gave the severance package to the 5,000 oh. and then hired, <laughs> and then hired them back. Oh God. That was uh, right during the bankruptcy period. Um, they had to reduce and they, and, and they do this every once in a while. They'll, they'll come around and they say, Hey, we're going to have to let go about, you know, anywhere from 50 to uh, at our plant. There was, I think there was like 45. I can't recall the number. I don't have the number exactly, but I can tell you that they had, uh, had to let go a good amount of our salary people because they had to cut back and we were in going into this bankruptcy period. So they offered this severance package and they had to agree if they take X amount of dollars, they were given X amount of uh, unemployment, they were getting a certain amount of pay. And we weren't allowed to see any of this. They, they took their people in up to the personnel department and they gave this package with the disc that explained everything that they were going to receive. And they actually signed a document that says that they wouldn't work for Jenna Moore's corporation anymore. Well, if you recall, Jenna Moore's ended up changing names. And it says now Jenna Moore's Propulsion Systems, LLC. So they were able to hire those people back under a different name. And there are people that were let go that are not supposed to be working for Jenna Moore that are now working for Jenna Moore's. And that's a fact. And they got this massive package. They got a very good package. 
Yeah, yeah, I also say it was a very nice, uh, high paid uh, vacation, long vacation that they were able to go and do whatever they want. Well, the rest of us took concessions. Like I said, we lost a freeze in our wage. Our pension still is still the same. Our pension amount has not changed. We, we haven't received an extra holiday. I mean, maybe one in over 16 years, even our vacation, the, uh, our vacation entitlement, we're allowed to have two, we get 200 hours after 20 years of employment. I, I know at other facilities, other manufacturers and companies that they go by the amount of hours that you work and they get a day off here. If you work X amount of hours, this earns you a day off. You could work as far as for full time, it's like 1,670 something hours or 1,620, I believe it is. Um, that's 40 hours and you get your 200 hours, but you're really working over, I think it's like 2,000 something hours a year or more because you got to add those Saturdays in there. You're required Saturdays. And if you have, uh, if you're in the assembly plant, that's even worse. You know, you're talking 56 hours a week, mandatory, and sometimes those are on nine-hour days sometimes. It's just, they it's a lot of twisted language, twisted perceptions about the UAW employee. You know, and the, and the one thing that I, I, I try to tell people to under, that, that don't understand what the union is trying to do with this strike, it is a huge social movement. It, it's a monster social movement. And... And it's just not Sean Payne. Everyone is pointing the finger at Sean Payne. And this has included all your, your big three CEOs. It's not uh, anyone to blame. It's to say, hey, Sean, they're trying to say, Sean, hey, don't don't start this. You know, we're not going to get our, our bonuses. We're not going to get our high, high wages. Like our CEO, she's not going to get the $6.2 million bonus that she got this year. You know, just for doing whatever she's doing, what and that's that's decreasing the amount of hourly workforce here in the United States. You know, and and doing stock buybacks to make the stock look like it's doing well. Yeah. And and they're doing well at doing that. You know, you're not hearing that part of it. You know, you only hear it's the UAW's fault. And I'm glad that you invited us to this media because the other side of the media, some of the other big networks, I won't mention no names. I'm just going to say. Some of the um, other party, or the other government parties that we talk about that really don't like the UAW because, hey, we're trying to rebuild the middle class. And when somebody asks me, hey, why are you guys asking so much? Um, and I always come back at them. I'm like, listen, it's not that we're asking too much. He goes, why aren't you asking for more? Why aren't you trying to come up to our wage? That's, that's what we're trying to do. Absolutely. That is such a good point because so many people have been convinced that their value is so low as a worker, while profits across the board are staggering in every industry. It isn't just GM. It isn't just the big three, but the big three in the first quarter or first six months of this year had a $21 billion profit expected to be about what, 32 by the end of this year. And you all Many of the UAW workers are struggling to survive. And this is, a, this is the important point I think we really need to make with people. You mentioned that some of the workers are not going to have pensions, like Michelle. And Michelle and I had a conversation prior to this as well, where she told me where she started and where she was offered to come back after the bust. And we will talk about that, Michelle. But there are so many positions like hers that were they started out as is it considered part time then is that the term that it's that they're called part time workers yeah, part time temps. is there another term, term? okay part time temps where they have been working as part time temps since the bust and after the bust and rec and it's important to note that General Motors itself started making record profits again in twelve oh. two thousand twelve oh yeah so eleven years ago again already and as as you stated three dollar raise. And none of those concessions that y'all made during the bust have been given back. Explain the hourly side of this a little bit to, for people to grasp this, where you have the temp workers who don't have any benefits at all. Am I correct? <laughs> yeah, they, they don't. They make an hourly wage and they get no benefits. 
They're working sometimes seven days a week. They're not really part time. The, the temps and <laughs> and I was very lucky. I'm you know and and I consider myself very lucky in comparison to a lot of the workers like Michelle and even some of the temps that are in our in our plant right now. I didn't have to go through all that. You know I'm very fortunate that I went into the skilled trades program. But now that I'm actually representing them, I see what they had to go through. I hear what they had to go through, and you know, I have a. I guess a soft spot, I guess you could say, when I start hearing what they what they went through compared to what I go through, I'm like, I I, I had it made compared to them. Uh, part-time temps, they work uh, four days a week, and it's what GM tells them to work. Up here in Bay City, we're lucky. We got management that are willing to work with the temps and say, okay, well, we know we only get you four days a week. What would work for you? We're, and that's why I say I, I don't want to put down our local management because I think they do a heck of a job working with our, our bargaining team and and working with the employee. And, and Michelle can vouch for me on that one. She knows that as soon as she came up here, it was a whole different uh, family environment in Bay City. And that's why I, I, I'm not going to put down uh, Bay City's management. But at other facilities, I do know they make them work the worst shift. The worst days of the week, and they might make them work on a, a Friday, Saturday, Monday, Tuesday. They might make them work Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Uh, they, they could even break it up to Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday. And it's just whatever. It's always over the weekend. It, it's, sure. it's, it's, it's a lot during the weekend for down the assembly plants because of the what an hourly member could call in with and, and use some call-in time. They only get one week, though. So they would get that call in time. And, and sometimes, you know, they need the money. They need the job. So if a higher seniority employee says, hey, I need this weekend off, they put their name and said, okay, well, I'll work this weekend. And they would just, okay, and they jump at the opportunity because it's, you don't make any money. it's the four days. And they get half the wage, which is yes. even all. Explain what their wage is. What are the wages? Because I'm flabbergasted. Oh, my God. I it's 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 like a, at I think uh, in in the early right around the bankruptcy period it was around fifteen dollars an hour, and we're stuck at thirty dollars an hour. And I rounded I rounded them up, you know I rounded to the nearest five. So we're we're right right around fifteen for the part time wages at that time, and we're at thirty dollars for us uh, legacies. We call them seniority employees, and we're we're making a, a more more money than they were obviously and they were doing they were doing the same jobs that the seniority employee was doing and getting paid half the price and so of course and they're, still, that, and they're not getting raises at all are no, they they're not no they're getting nothing they had to wait until they get hired in and if you in the contract in a current contract we had it takes them about eight years as a, once they get hired in as an in progression employee and and that was the one thing that, and I think Michelle's very well of the in progression language, how a person goes from one wage all the way up to, it takes them eight years to get there. And that's not including, let's not forget, they got to first get in as a part-time and then a full-time temp, then a full-time in progression employee. It could take you anywhere from, it just depends on when they decide to put you on this full-time, full-time temporary employee. It could take you anywhere from ten to eight years to and even maybe even longer. I've known temps that have been temps for five to six years right in our own plant, and we are we were pushing for them to get hired and luckily for us, we had a different uh, management come in, and they said, "Hey, we need our temps well then put them on as as full time okay, we'll put them on as full time and that started their clock. That was the good thing about the two thousand and nineteen agreement. Is that started their clock as far as once they started it, as long as they continued their employment for two years, then we got them in as a full time seniority employee. So they were no longer a temp. But it took them two years just to get to that stage. Now they got to work eight years to become at full wage to what I'm in. And think about it, eight, what can happen in eight years? Look what happened in you know, 16 years. You know, we three dollar raise. I mean, they're they're barely not even getting a full raise yet, a full wage. So that's just it, it, it's it's heart. They don't get 
and they don't get benefits. They get benefits after 90 days, and but they got to be a full time temp, and they get a different right. they get a different uh, uh, benefit package than me. They don't get the same one as I do. I get a different one than they do. And like I said, they don't get a pension, obviously, and that's part of that benefit package. Uh, they get actually they get nothing as a as a temp. It's when they become in progression. When they become in progression, then they start their retirement savings, a four hundred one k match. So they could spend anywhere from two, Man. four, five, six years as a temp and receive nothing for their their retirement. So you know, there's it's it's a lot of twisted language that doesn't benefit the the UAW hourly worker. Let's just say the middle class American. It doesn't it doesn't help us, and that's what we're trying to. We're trying to improve the life status no. of the current workers, and we're trying to get that opportunity out for everybody else and rebuild the middle class. That's what this whole thing's about. We, if it starts with us and where it always has started. Yeah, thirty dollars an hour is what minimum wage should be with inflation in 2023. Like between 28 and $30 an hour. And that's what people need to realize because when some people hear $30 an hour, they're like, oh my God, you make so much money. No, no, not with the cost of living. When the average, the average car is $46.2,000, the average price of a home in Michigan overall is upwards of $260,000. Some places in Michigan, it's over $520,000. And in some places, we have plants where people work and live, especially in the more urban areas. It's not a lot of money. You're barely still surviving. Back in the day, it was great money. Yeah, Today, it's yeah. not. Uh, it's um, not. Yeah. Just take a look at uh, uh, a car. GM, along with Chrysler, or Stellantis, I'm sorry, I'll say Stellantis. And Ford and all the other manufacturers, just not the big three. And I, and I, they always point out the big three. It's the big three. It's the big three. It's every auto manufacturer in the United States that, that are having their cars sold here, but they could be built somewhere else. It doesn't matter. If they're being sold here, you are not going to find a car for less than $20,000 after this year. Uh -uh. Less than $20,000. You can barely find one now. So the cost of cars. When we start talking about you know wages, okay, well you got to have a wage that can sustain that inflation of vehicles, the housing market, the interest rates, and everybody needs to start realizing it's not because of us, the UAW worker, that did this. This is yep. corporate greed. That exactly what Mr. Fain is saying. That is what exactly. Uh, all of our negotiators are at the table right now fighting for. They're saying, hey, this ain't about us. We didn't cause this. You guys, you know, you're talking a $6.2 million incentive bonus for Miss, you know, the, our current CEO. And she's not the only one making those incentive bonuses. She's not. You know, there's other ones. So it's just not Mary Barra. It's every corporation CEO out there right now. Yep. And, and that's... You know, and, and that's why I'm not picking on just one CEO. I'm telling you, it's all your CEOs. Mo the majority of your CEOs are 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 just pushing us down and pushing down the the, the middle class. They, what they're trying to do is eliminate the middle class, and and that's been been going on for at least fifteen to twenty years. They've always tried to get rid of unions. I mean, right to work. Remember that one. And we're, we're lucky that, you know. Thank you, Gretchen Whitmer, for yes. reversing that. I Michigan appreciate it. Yeah, she did a great job in, in getting that, you know, turned, you know, back the way it should be here in the state of Michigan, you know. and, and It's such, it's, you know, the, the language that they use, you know, because it's ALEC, American Le Legislative Exchange, and the National Right to Work Coalition are the ones who, ALEC is really the one who designed that language for for the, the right to work state. And they have been pa passing that mass legislation across the country. And they use the language and the rhetoric because they're so very good at propaganda to spin it. That right to work is you have an individual right to negotiate with your employer what you are worth when all it is is that your employer can tell you what you're worth and this is all you're going to make and you don't have a right to negotiate and you don't have a right to collective bargain and you are kept down in a very low wage because the bottom line is profits. 
And that is what happens in an unfettered capitalist society in which we live. And that's why wages are so low across the board. People are struggling. Nobody owns anything anymore. Everybody lives on credit because you can't own anything anymore. The bank owns everything. So what we are fighting for is what our ancestors and the people before us, like the, the, the UAW with the sit-ins in 36 and 37, they, that really was the catalyst for unions in this country and people to get fair wages. And look at all the laws that have happened since then. Children were taken out of the factory. Safety was improved. While Ford, Henry Ford, I, I'll give him this credit because he was the one that started the 40-hour work week and $5 a day wages way back in the day because he had the foresight to understand my workers need to be able to buy my cars, need to be able to afford to buy my cars. Now, if General and Mortars, they don't give a shit about that any yes, longer. If General Motors and Stellantis and Ford now, if they would get on that same page as their ancestors have seen, I think they would understand what we're trying to do. You know, you can't make a product that your own employees can't afford. Yeah, and when it all boils down to it, you know, you it's got to start somewhere. It's got to start with your workers. You know, we talk investments, um, and you hear it from all the CEOs of the big three. They want to invest. They want to invest. Invest in your workers. Start there first, because you invest in us first. I guarantee you. We're going to be driving your high priced cars because you pay us to do that because we're your first advocate for you. We're the first person. They're going to look at me and say, where do you work at? I work for GM. Oh, you do? Do you like it? Yes, I do. And this is the vehicle I drive because of the company I work for. And, and, and look at how nice it is. You want to take it for a drive? You want to take my brand new Silverado that was just built down in Fort Wayne? Or in Arlington, you know, it was built right here in the United States. Uh, the camshaft was made right here in Bay City. I can say the camshaft that goes in this vehicle, I help make. And you want to take it for, go ahead, take it for, we are the advocates for General Motors. And the only. And there used to be, there used to be so much pride. Oh, yeah. Like I grew, there, there I grew up in a GM family. I grew up in a GM, my grandfather worked for GM, was the, fir the first, you know, back in the day. And. There was such pride in American made and General Motors and the big three. And I, it's died. Nothing's built here. I mean, things are built here now. They're not made here anymore. So, like, I, the perfect example is the Ford commercial fully assembled in America when it used to be like made in America. Now it's fully assembled in America. Nothing, most of the parts are not made in America any longer. And that's unfortunate. You know, so this, this Pride has died. Yeah. And because of what they're doing to you all. That's a big part of it. If something were to change in this contract, if anything happens in this contract, I would lose I would love to see more product being made here right in in, in the United States. And and bring bring back the mop, bring back all, a lot of that work that is being outsourced or being contracted to third party countries. I was part of a lot, or even, or even companies, or a lot of the a lot of those companies who operate plants in the United States, as I've learned through my brother, that pay non union wages, and these people are starting out at thirteen, fourteen dollars an hour. Which Michelle, we're going to talk about how that happened to you at GM. I want to mention. <laughs> I want to mention something because I was it was totally at all the one time we were. I was part of launch way back in. I want to say in the. It was right around. When the Volt had just came out, uh, the Chevy Volt, and it was a great idea. I love the great. I love that idea because we actually had a a part in making that and the engine parts for that Chevy Volt, and they showed us how they made the casting for the connecting rod. That we we do a lot of connecting rods right here in Bay City. We make probably the best connecting rod. I will say, <laughs> <laughs> we have the best best machine. Of course. Of course. <laughs> um, but when uh, they showed us a video of how they actually forge this, how they actually make this product, and it's not even here in the United States. And I was appalled. I was like, oh, my God, I cannot believe they're making that. It was in a third world country. I don't even know where. But it showed some foreigner, and they had uh, uh, so two pair of channel locks, pliers, big pliers. And it showed a big old press coming down on metal that was being poured and just slammed down 
and the guy, there's no safety, nothing. He just grabs it with the players, takes it out, and he throws it on a pile red hot. Yeah, and, and, and that was the process. And I was like, wait a minute. We're General Motors. You know, we're, and this is not just GM. I don't, I don't want to just single out GM. This is all your big, big manufacturers, corporations around the United States. In order to make these profits and take those profits and not pay your employees here in the United States and make a product not just as safe, but make a product that is high quality, they go to countries that have no unionized labor, that have no safety measurings, uh, measurements. They have nothing. And I feel so bad for some of these workers because if you saw the conditions that they work in, you'd be like, wow. Uh, and, and they're just a number. If he gets hurt, they're just going to, hey, you get in here. It's time for you to go in there. Um, so it was just, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And... Uh, and and that's why you see like while well, you see like Saginaw, they're losing some work there. Why can't we bring back work to Saginaw? Uh, Saginaw used to be one of the biggest factors here. Uh, sure was. You know, we were, Saginaw and Flint. You know, look at yeah, we had Flint. I mean, there was a lot of we have so much opportunity from all of our auto manufacturing companies right now to bring this work back in the United States, reinvest reinvest in America, reinvest in the middle class you know you want to see your product really take off you want to see it really boom first start with your employees because it used to be one uaw hourly wage our wages would feed 20 families it re did reduce it's down to 10 families now my wage somehow supports 10 families right now because i am at a wage that is much higher than the lower class wage my middle class wage is up here Lower class is down here. I am supporting 10 other families according to the statistics. So, and a lot of people don't know that. And that's why what, what the UAW is trying to do down in Detroit is bring those people up to us. Bring the people up to our middle class wage. We're not saying we want to become billionaires and millionaires such as all your auto executives. We just want to have a middle class wage in which we can purchase a house. We can purchase one of their vehicles that we're making, reinvest in the company. You know, we just we just want the fair share, and it's don't not, have to, don't have to work multiple jobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have never seen the amount of. I guess when I was hired in '99, people were trying to get into GM. I mean, they were like clawing, and they were like, "I'll be a temp. I'll be a temp for 90 days." It used to be a 90-day time. You get past that 99, 90 days, they hired you. That language got taken out. Then they started having this other new language. But it used to be you would claw to get in there. You know, it is, I've never had this much difficulties trying to get people to work for GM. I've never, ever had this. And it's just incredibly, it's a it's a 180-degree turn. Uh, and when I say that, I, I even not only just talk about production employees, but I'm also talking about skilled trades. Um, I think you've probably seen the, the need for skilled trades employment everywhere is so high that I could, if I decided to walk away right now, I could get hired into a, another facility making either the same or more for somebody else, for my journeyman's card. Um, I can't get, I can't even get people to work skilled trades to get in the apprenticeship program because they're not making it lucrative enough. They're not looking, making it look like spectacular as it did when I was first hired. They're making it so generic that that's what the that's what the big bargainers for the other side do is they water down the job so bad that they make it sound like well anybody could do it. And that's not the that is not that is not that is not true at all. What these people do, what my members do in my district, there it's phenomenal. It's incredible. And if you saw the machines that they ran and you saw the computerized, the programming that is put that they're, that they're dealing with on a daily basis, you'd be like, I couldn't do this. They do it on a daily basis, but they not just run one machine. They run multiple machines. They have to know every aspect. And what happened from 19, I would say the early 90s all the way up until now is called automation. Automation is what really hurt us. 
because what they did is that we used to make a product and and we'll just say uh, connecting rods let's just say that and it, it's just a small piece that has a lot of machining done to it it may do a machine might grind one machine might drill one machine might mill one machine might clean one machine you know it, it did each operation or did a machining process one machine would and what happened now is we have one machine that does all the processes so what it did is that having we went from having maybe seven or eight technicians or production workers to one and that one person is one one machine that used to have six or seven people do the process of making that part but it also became more complicated become more Techno te the technology technology just went out of the roof. Uh, even even our camshafts right now, the camshafts that we make, uh, it used to take anywhere from seven to ten people to make that camshaft from start to finish. Now it takes an average of probably about three to four, if that. And that is from start to finish. I want to say in our in our plant in one of the departments that Michelle works at, it takes about one, two, three. I'm going to say about seven total. And if you saw the operations from start to finish, I bet you there's at least 20. I mean, and we're, we're, we're making like anywhere from uh, average of 1,500 a day of cams that we make. So it's, it's incredible to see the technology, how it's advanced, but it hasn't advanced for our advantage. <laughs> it's, yeah, it, it, I just would like to see them get paid for really what they know because what they know is how to run those machines, how to put the different offsets that, that they have to know how to do to make a good quality part. And I think what a lot of people don't understand when it comes to facilities like ours, you got to have somewhat of an education. You have to know computers. You have to know math. If you don't know math, you're in trouble. And these, these people aren't just pushing buttons. They have to look at sheets and data and say, I have to decrease this by so many. And we're talking measurements that you cannot even see with the naked eye. So that's how, 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 how precise our equipment is, how precise our parts are being measured, yet they want to have them do it at a very low, low wage. You know, and, and I think that's what a lot of people, they don't understand, they don't comprehend what production people actually do at facilities like Bay City and even in the assembly plants you know they're they, it, theirs is based on quality theirs is based on if that bolt has to be in there a certain torque and if something goes wrong they have to hurry up and get that machine going their trades are right there on the spot it, it, it's everywhere our quality is by far one of the best and I think that a lot of people don't understand what that quality means to a lot of people I know for Michelle and myself we take a lot of pride in what we do. If we see something, we raise our hand. If a machine's not sounding right, we're going to raise our hand. And we're on it before they could even say anything or do anything. We stop machines from right making any more parts because there might be a, 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 a containment, a spill is what we call it, a spill. We don't want that to get to the customer. So we're very protective of our customers. Once that line... Uh, is stop. We start looking at parts. We hurry up and contain whatever, and that way we make sure that a camshaft, a connecting rod that we make here in Bay City, it doesn't get into your engine when you buy that vehicle. It is it is a very very volatile process, but it's a volatile process that is is beneficial beneficial for the customer, and we want to protect our our jobs and saying, look, we want you to keep investing in Bay City and other plants here in Michigan. In the, in the United States, because we take pride, like you were saying, we take pride in our work. I think when it all boils down to it, that's what they need to be looking at down at the bargaining table is saying, okay, are we not really giving these people what we're being paid? They're being paid. You know, uh, look at what they're doing. Look at what they've accomplished for us um, over the past 16 years. That's what I would love to see the bargainers actually take a look at what we've done. We've transitioned over from our internal combustion engine and we're going to transition over to ev electronics uh electrical vehicle the electric vehicle and they're 
doing a phenomenal job. Our hourly workforce is already doing it. And a lot of people don't know that, that we are already transitioning. We're going to start making products that will support that business on top of still running the business for the internal combustion engine. Now, how many employers can do both at the same time? There's not a lot of people that can do that. But our people can. Our UAW members are, we're always up for the challenge, and we've always we've always made it happen. We've completed any goal that they gave us. Um, you know, and that's and that and I'm I'm I know for a fact, and I, I know that Michelle probably doesn't know this, but I've sat in, in several meetings here in Bay City where they've gone over a budget. Every plant gets a budget. And I know our budget, we've been in the positive. We've done very, very well. We've met all the goals that our management and our UAW are aware of. We've met it. And it wasn't because of people like me that are representatives. It's people like Michelle. It's people like our skilled trades uh, getting those machines running the way when they need to be running. It's people like Michelle and all her production team that continue to look for the defects in the products to keep that from going out to the customer. I mean, that is how we do it. And we make our customer goals. We meet their delivery. When, we, when they got to have the parts for their engines, if they're on the dock. They're already on the road. They'll be there. When, when do you need them? You need them by the end of the week. They'll be there tomorrow. That's high quality work right there. That's being on top of it. And, and, and that's why it's very important that I think they need to see that. Down south, the big executives, they got to see what's happening down here at the lowest level. You see what's happening at the lowest level? You know that your employees take pride in what they do. Michelle, I know she does. The rest of my, both districts take pride in what they do. Invest in us. Invest in your workers. Then the rest of America will invest in you, in the company. They'll start seeing, hey, Jenna Moore is back. They're back. And they are. They're making some phenomenal vehicles. You've seen them. And the, the first people that can afford them are your employees. And then your suppliers. Your suppliers that, you know, I know we get like our steel from a steel company. The, our suppliers should be able to afford them. And, and that's where it's just a domino effect for the middle class. Once it gets to our factories, our workers, our production workers, our skilled trades workers, once that, that middle class wage gets reinstated to where it should be, according to right now, then you'll start seeing everybody else's wage steadily increase. It's got to start somewhere. And this is that social movement that I believe that Sean Fain is doing. My chairman, who I know he's probably going to get a big head when I say this, I actually listen to him. And when I, when I say I listen to him, normally I'm stubborn. And you'll hear that from a lot of people that voted for me. Yeah, he's abrasive. He's stubborn. He's very aggressive. But I actually listened to him this time. He goes, Chris, this, this whole thing is it's not about the big three. This is about everyone. This is a social movement that's trying to rebuild the middle class. He's trying to get everyone to understand that you are not getting paid what you should be getting paid. You should be getting paid, you know. Yeah, I guess that's what it. this is about. So, Michelle, you and I talked over the phone prior to this podcast, and you were telling me a little bit about your story. So, I would like you were a temp employee in 2007. I'd like to start there with you because I want you to also explain and state what you were making prior to the 2008 bust and then what they offered you to come back wasn't even really an offer. <laughs> And then, and then your story from there. Great. Uh, thanks for having us. We really do appreciate the time uh, to come here and just tell our side of the story. Uh, my career started in 2001 with General Motors. I came from, my father was the OG. Uh, he hired in with General Motors in Lordstown in 1970. He reminds me all the time that I was the first GM baby. Um, so that started it. And uh, for me, he instilled that pride right from the beginning. Like, I don't even remember the day that started, but from the day that I can even remember wanting a job, it was always, my goal was always to get to General Motors, even as, you know, a young adult, as a, you know, a teenager, you know, get the job at GM, get the job at GM. At that time, uh, it was all based on referrals. So you had to have somebody put your name in. You couldn't just walk off the street. You had to have somebody in there that would be willing to vouch for you to get you in the door. 
So 2001, I get my break. I'm in my 30s, probably 31 or 32, uh, because it was that hard to get in there. I started in, I walked in, they sat me down at a table with a, about 15 other people said, you're going to make $16.86 an hour. And my eyes kind of bulged out of my head in 2002. There was, you know, I've never made that kind of money in my life. As a matter of fact, even up to that point, I had worked two jobs to support my family, uh, minimum wage usually, fast food or deli, uh, supermarket, stuff like that. So you get in the door and every year you're hoping, you know, is this the year I'm going to get hired? Is this the year I'm going to get hired? So I'm one of the longest people that I know that have done summer help. I was summer help for seven years. And on my seventh year, they decided they were going to hire me. But in between, in, in all that seven years, it was usually only, you know, for the summer. I was gone in 90 days. There was one time I was extended for nine months, and that was the beginning of extended temps. So we thought it was a great thing back then, but you see what it is now where temps are temps for years now. So um, I'm not sure that that was the greatest thing, but it, it sounded good at the time. Uh, 1686 is what they brought me in at, and that didn't include COLA, and it didn't include um, shift differential. So all that was on top of my 1686. That was just my base rate. Did that for six years. On the seventh year, they brought me back, and uh, that was right when GM was starting to have trouble. The, the economy was failing and, and all the issues were coming to a head with the big three. And when they brought me in the door, they said, well, let me, let me say at the end of my, when they laid me off at the end of my sixth year, I was making 23 and change. So you accumulated raises uh, during that time. Any working time that you had went towards your raises that you got. So I was up to 23 and some change. And when I came back the following year, that was in 2008, uh, they told me you got to make fourteen twenty nine an hour. That's they it. They cut your wages by you know? $10, almost $9 an hour. So, yes. So in 2001, they bring me in the door at sixteen eighty six. Seven years later, fourteen twenty nine. take it or leave it. So, you know, as I, it's, I signed the paper. I, I wanted in. I, it didn't matter. But those before the bankruptcy had even been filed, my plant, at least, I don't know if that's how it was across the board, but at least my plant was making concessions just to save, you know, what we can here. So that was in June of uh, 2008. And now I'm in. I think I got it made. And the economy crashes. December comes around. And uh, I don't know why, but GM is just famous for doing this uh, around a holiday just to destroy your kind of your mental. I mean, it ruins things. Uh, in December, they announced that uh, we're losing uh, shift and that BB and low seniority was certainly the first one out. So um, they have to give you there's a warn notice. They have to give you, I think, 90 days. Uh, so in February, they worked us every other week. One week on, one week on layoff, one week on, one week on, till they met the requirement for the warn notice. And then in February, I was laid off in 2009 at 14.29 an hour. I was brought back. I mean, in October, they brought us back. But that was my only, I think that was my only real significant layoff. But losing those wages uh, from, from starting out at 16.86 to 2001 to starting back at two dollars plus two fifty two dollars and fifty cents less an hour seven years later, uh, those were when the concession started, even even as early as then. And you were so, in Lordstown at this point. Um, I was in Lordstown at that time. We were making the Chevy Cavalier, the Pontiac Pursuit, and the Sunfire Pontiac Sunfire. We made three cars. So the Pursuit, I think, was sold up in Canada. They were hollering about shutting us down, and uh, there was a big campaign in our town. Uh, to um, to get the new to get another product, so and that's when we landed the cruise, and we got the cruise. We were super excited about that, but we really put on a, a big campaign to to get that car in there. So I worked pretty steady Saturdays, some Sundays as well. Uh, you know, for for ten years, uh, everything was going what we thought was pretty well. In 2016, GM pulls together and uh, calls a all people's meeting. Uh, to announce that they're cutting a shift. I still remained safe during that time. I'd acquired enough seniority, but uh, my son, who was there as a temp at the time, 
uh, was told he was going to be let go. He was just a, he was only a temp for nine months, but he was told he was going to be let go. But that was the hardest I'd ever seen him work temps in my whole life. Uh, was the year that my son was out there, but it was enough to make my son go back to college. So he he knew he knew uh, he knew that uh, no he knew for sure assembly line work wasn't for him. So uh, uh, he ended up taking that opportunity to go back to school and um, made his way. So uh, at one time my plant was about eleven thousand strong. So that was probably back in the seventies and eighties. And when they started shutting things down at my plant, when they started eliminating shifts, we were about 5,000 in that time frame. So the final numbers that you'll get from my plant closing was GM lost 1,500 jobs. Well, they lost 1,500 at the end, but they were losing 1,500 at a time every time they would cut a shift. So the word comes around finally in 2017 the very end of 2017, I think it was. No, I think it was actually beginning of 2018, right around April maybe, uh, that we're going to lose uh, second shift. Now that that does affect me. I'm out on layoff and uh, nobody knows what's going on with the plant. You know, we're still in the middle of sales. We're, we're really down for all the way across the board, but we were still out producing. I remember this was always the talk in the plant. We were out producing uh, the Malibu when things were getting worse, but Malibu's probably a, a higher, you know, they just make more money on a Malibu than they would a cruise, I would imagine, you know, so logistically. Around Christmas time of 2018, in the meantime, we're on layoff, and they announce in 2018, actually, let me, let me, let me state how, how this worked. In 2018, in November, on exactly November 26th, this is the Monday after Thanksgiving, GM calls another all people's meeting and announces they're closing the plant. Plants closed. So they wait till the day after Thanksgiving, but your holidays are screwed. You know, forget about it, you know. Yeah, so this is how it worked out for me. I'm on unemployment from June to December. When they announce that the plant is closing, people start putting in for other plants. Everybody's trying to find a place to go. What, what do we do? You know, uh, it's chaos. It's turmoil in the plant. Everybody is, we're scared. We don't know, you know. My plant was there for 53 years. So producing, geez, everything from vans to subcompact cars. And everything is just in turmoil. And people are being shipped off to Missouri, off to Spring Hill. We're not just talking, making a two-hour drive to Toledo. While some people did get to go there, they're they're being sent out nine hours away, you know, as far as a drive. So everybody starts putting in, and now we have decisions to make. The plant closure is scheduled for March 2019. That's supposed to be the last day. Uh, December, I'm watching all these letters, FedEx. Nobody wants to see the FedEx coming because these are your mandated requirements to go. So here's how it works. If... If you are forced to go to another plant, offered a job, if you turn it down, you're done with General Motors. If you request to go to another plant, you have voluntary, that's voluntary. But if it comes down to, hey, we've closed your plant, we've lost your shift, we're going to send you somewhere. If you turn it down, you, you're you just done. You're done with General Motors. So you have to make a decision. Am I going to stick with this job that still provides job security and a wage that, you know, is functional, you know, or do I relocate my family? Do I separate from my family? What do I do? I was two weeks away in seniority from being shipped to Wentzville, Wentzville, Missouri. That's where it is. So I'm two weeks away in seniority from being shipped out to Wentzville, Missouri. You know, I don't know what to do. Uh, in I had in for Spring Hill, Tennessee. I thought I could make the move. On Christmas Eve, they sent me the letter saying, okay, you've got your rec for Christmas or for, for Spring Hill, Tennessee. You have till January 1st to make up your mind. Well, this destroys Christmas. You know, I'm sick in bed. I don't know what to do. My family, my mom, I'm taking care of my mom, my kids, you know, they're older, but you know, my family, do you, what do you do? Do you make the move or what? I decided against it. And then General Motors comes around and says, hey, uh, we need you to come back and shut the plant down. 
And at this time, they'd offered us TRA, which is a, a if you're laid off from general, or if you're laid off, you get uh, some assistance to go back to school and requalify for a job that's in demand. So they made us go through all that. I'm all set up. I'm ready to go. Signed up for school, got all the paperwork, the legwork done on my end, because it's a lot of work. Got all that paperwork, all that legwork done on my end. Then I get my letter says, hey, come back to your local plant and shut it down for three months. So now we're stuck with the opportunity before us, either take the one time TRA, go get your schooling and move on, or come back and shut your plant down for three months and then you're back out on the streets. You make your choice, but it's one or the other, and you don't get a second shot at either of them. So I made the I made the decision to go back and shut my plant down uh, in January, and all I was thinking was it's just going to buy me a little more time. Maybe something will come through. Maybe they'll change their mind about closing the plant. I don't know. You know, I'm just hoping. I'm just trying to buy some time. So we go back in, and after all the legwork and. Uh, they, they start us back up. We go back to, I went back to my old job. You know, I got to work. I worked on the door line, uh, shout out 2018 door line. Uh, but uh, I went back to the door line, was able to do and work in the same area that I left from before. And on March 6th, I shot my last, uh, my last boat on a white two door, four door Chevy cruise, you know, and it was heartfelt. I mean, people were walking out of the plant that day. We left our shoes. Some of us left our work shoes outside the plant, just kind of as a, a statement of protest, you know, that we we never should have been shut down in the first place. One of the other things that I wanted to mention was on June 22nd, that was my last day of work at General Motors before my initial layoff, June 22nd of 2018. On the 21st, GM announces the day before my last day, GM announces that they're going to make the Chevy Blazer in Mexico, which we felt should have, that should have come to us. We should have had that. Yeah, we should have had that, that business. Uh, for whatever reason, GM decides not to, and, you know, lives are devastated. So my, my story is just one. And this, this is just a, a simple, basic rundown of, of what's happened to me. But my story is only one of 5,000 in that plant. And even though our final numbers say, well, you lost 1,500 people, we lost 5,000. And if you went back to the 80s, uh, you know, Way like I said, it was that. a plant of almost 11,000, yeah. 11,000 people. It was like a city. It was like a city out there. And it was something we were proud of. Like I said, it was instilled in me. I build GM, I buy GM. If my dad saw a foreign car or even just another maker, you know, in my, you know, in my driveway, he'd be like, Hey, whose car is that? Why are they driving? You know, he, he instilled that in us, you know, and it was that pride that we're talking about. I am proud to buy GM. I am proud to have been able to support my family and to put my son through school and to provide even now. So where I am right now, uh, I'm, I'm five hours away from home. I live in a little apartment up here in, in Michigan. I still, I love Michigan, first of all. I, I never thought I would, I would, I, I'd never been here. Uh, I've never even traveled into Michigan until the day I came to look for my apartment up here. And uh, that was the very first time, but I've really grown to love it. It's such a beautiful state. But my home is in Ohio and my family is there. My mom uh, lives in my home uh, back in Ohio. So I still have my house in Ohio. Uh, my mom lives there. She's 81. My daughter's just moved in with her uh, to kind of help take care of her. My niece stays there to kind of help with things around the house. But, you know, financially, I'm supporting two households. I still pay those bills. I still, you know, I pay to get the grass cut. You know, I have things to do, but I got to pay rent up here. I have two households. And this is the story of so many people. I, I'm speaking specifically from my plant. We have so many people that work in Toledo or Indiana or Buffalo that still commute back home, Tonawanda, uh, that still commute back home, just like I do. I'm home one or two weekends a month, whatever I'm allotted, you know, whenever I can get back there. Sometimes I'm not home for three months at a time, you know, and I'm dependent on other people to, to help take care of things back home. My sister is sick. She struggles. She's been diagnosed with uh, multiple myeloma. There's no cure for that, but I'm here. And it doesn't matter 
what you pay me. You will never, ever pay me the time that what my time is worth to be away from my family. It's, it's killing me to do that. To, and while, while I am so grateful to be able to have a job where I can send money back home or I can help out with other needs, you know, I'm, I'm the only one in my family now that works for General Motors because of the because of the closure of Lordstown, like my dad got my uncles in, my my cousins in, my 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 nephews, you know that that was stemmed from from my father, you know. But they're retired. They've they've decided it's not worth the move, you know, all those things. But you know what what that what dollar value do you put on? I don't get to see my sister this month, you know, or I don't get to see my nieces and nephews grow. You understand what 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 dollar value do you put on any of that? I used to think when we when we went out on the last strike in 2019, this was never it was not ever. My purpose for being out there was not about more money for me. It wasn't. And I don't know if that's right or wrong, but at that point my my plight was for where I came from, was for the temps. For I've never in my life seen temps work 2 years, 3 years solid. I mean, this is no layoff. When I was a temp, I knew it. Coming in 30, 30 or 90 days and you're out, 90 days and you're out. But with this new, with this new temp status thing, uh, this was really what my plight was for uh, because I was them. And I sat in a room uh, with Chris and some other team, team leaders and uh, some exec from uh, Detroit came in and was given his take on the contract, the company spin on the contract, but I'm in a room with people that have seniority that's, I still feel similar to mine, even though I have 15 years and they may only have three, I'm still that in progression employee. I'm the one without the pension. I'm the one that when I leave General Motors, I leave just like I never worked there. I have no pension. All I have is a certificate that says 15 years, 30 years, however long I'm there for. That's all I leave with. Nothing else. Uh, they do do, like I said, the 401k. Awesome. I love, I love that I have that. But I'm talking to my father on the phone, who has a pension. Who, who, who they, really, uh, GM has just left them in the dust. Uh, they, there's no, there's no. I asked my dad about that. Just you know, he said he hasn't had anything significant in several years. And if, if he did get anything, he said it's. He knows it's less than a hundred dollars cumulative over several years that they were, I don't, I don't even know if, you know, he's older now too. He's in his seventies. So I'm not sure, you know, when you, when you talk about companies making 40 billion, however, however many, billion, I just don't understand maybe from my perspective, what the difference is between 40 billion and 39 billion. You know what I mean? Like how much? It's an ungodly amount of money. And I, I know that I know that everybody wants to be number one, but I don't get what's the, really the difference between number one and number two. I mean, it, it is at the expense of you all is what it is. It's, it's 100 percent at the expense of the workers, because without you, these cars would not exist. Exactly. So, you know, I assembly line work is way different than the work that I do right now. My body is tore up. I was only in assembly for 10 years and God love the people that can do it for 30 and 40 years. My shoulders are shot. My knees are shot. My back is, is wrecked. You know, the, to the toll that it takes on you just being there. I know everybody thinks you just shoot a couple bolts and you move on, but I'm shooting, I'm shooting bolts and I'm, I'm threading weather strips and I'm, I'm using my body 400, 500 cars a day, but that's not the impact. I'm shooting, you know, four screws on this car and weather strips here, push pins here, it's, it's unbelievable the toll that it takes. Nobody would have ever. I'm going to tell you, when I first walked into GM, I'll never forget my first day. They threw me back in the body shop, and my job was to put on fenders. And they uh, had a guy staying over. His name was Teddy. I'll never forget him. Uh, an Italian guy, but he didn't speak very much English. So the communication between the two of us was, was lacking, to say the least. At the end of his four hours, I'm still only doing half the job, and Teddy, it's time for him to go. And they're like, shut it down. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, they're going to throw me out. You know, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't even know that he never even told me the whole job yet. 
And uh, I remember thinking to myself, I'm never going to make it. I don't know how people do this for 30 years. Those were my thoughts the very first day. And in the meantime, you know, my dad's worked there. My uncle's a foreman there. My other uncle's assembly line somewhere else. If they've all made it, so the pressure's on, you know, you got you to gotta do it. And uh, that was probably the worst day of my <laughs> assembly line career. It was terrible, <laughs> but I'll never forget it. But it's underestimated. When I got home uh, for, for weeks, you know, from just holding a gun, you know, your 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 hands are crimped and, and your arms and Oh, your fingers are so sore. Everything is just, it is a labor intensive job. And it may not sound like a much, but when you're shooting, like I said, four bolts on a car, 400 cars a day, that's 1600 bolts. Plus it's an overworked job anyhow. And you're doing other things on top of that. You know, it's really underestimated work. And I used to think I wasn't skilled labor. I am skilled. I am very skilled and I know my job. You know, I thought that I, I mentioned this to you before, too. You know, like uh, I would tell people, you're, you're just a number at GM. You're just a number. But I don't even say that anymore because numbers have value. And when we come to a contract and you say, hey, man, uh, we've only made three dollars more the last how many years? Uh, where is my value? I'm not even a number. I don't even rate and I don't qualify for whatever bubble you're in. I don't. I don't understand that. Um, it's not like, I feel like as a UAW worker, when I look back at the 80s, we set the bar. We just, we set the bar for, like I said, that, that's all I wanted to do was be an auto worker. I knew that I was, not only that I was walking in, I'd never look for a job again in my life because at that time you didn't. You got, you went to work for GM and that was your career, your job. I didn't worry about moving or anything like that, but when you get in there and you're you're making 1686 and you're thinking great 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 and then seven years later they're like we like you and all but we're going to cut you down to fourteen dollars even though you you know you did a good job we brought you back every year we're going to knock you down ten dollars an hour and that's part of the restructuring that's part of whatever whatever it takes just get me in the door get me in the door but that kind of mentality is the kind of mentality you're fed just be lucky you got a job be lucky you got a job be lucky you know. I, I am lucky. Yes. I don't subscribe to that. <laughs> I don't think it's a lot. And I, like I said, I, I don't want to appear ungrateful and I will never forget where I came from. Those years of working two jobs from, I remember working, I would go, I got kids at home. I have kids at home and I'd work at Staples during the day selling ink pens. And then I'd go to the deli in my town at night selling roast beef. And I saw my kids, you know, for 20 minutes, maybe not every day, but I mean, I, I was doing it as often and as much as I could, you know, so I will never forget where I came from. But that's why my fight, in, especially in 2019, was for was for the temporary worker. Let's do this right. Let's treat them like they're supposed to be treated, not put them at wages that I was making 20 years ago. You're starting about it less than I was making 20 years ago. And I just don't. Right. And I don't see how that's justified when you're making profits like you're making. I, I don't I don't get, first of all, how your workforce is a third of what it used to be. And you're still yelling. You can't pay us anymore. You know what I'm saying? That I'm not buying into any of that. I really do believe that uh, the negotiations I am. I am pro Sean Fain all the way. I, I, I like his his tactics. I like his pursuit of what he's going after and even some of the things that that I've seen come to the table so far GM just put in writing I think it was last week that they're going to add the battery plants into this master contract that is huge because there's a battery plant in my town this could mean I could go home to my family and still make the wages that I'm making so this is a big deal for me you know and to make those kind of jumps and that was something I never I never even thought was on the table. I never, I never thought, you know, people are yelling about this 32 hour work week for 40 hour pay. Uh, this battery plant was something I never thought they were ever going to agree to. And if that sticks, you know, I got some, I got some more decisions to make, but these are less hard. Well, they, they are not hard decisions to make when you have to decide, do you go home to your family you know what I'm saying? Although I do, like I said, I do love Michigan. 
<laughs> right. I do love Michigan. Uh, I, I've really grown to love it. But that's kind of my story. But it's not just mine. The narrative that that this strike is is uh, affecting communities right now that we're we're putting people out of work is 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 a false narrative. Number one, because uh, I came from a plant that I man, I wish I knew the numbers of what my plant shutting down really caused because it wasn't just the 1500 I'll put some links in the show notes because I was I've been reading up on it Lordstown was a devastation just kind of it, Lordstown reminds me of what's happened here in mid Michigan with Saginaw and Flint you know with these with these plants closing down and just the the absolute it, it destroyed these communities is what it did and they don't take responsibility for they don't take responsibility for it, you know, and the, and the propaganda and the rhetoric, like the point that you made about the 32 hour work week, there are plenty of studies out there that 32 hours is far more productive for people. People get stuck on these, the way things have always been. Well, before the 40 hour work week, you're doing all, what y'all are basically doing were these mandatory seven days, but people were doing that back in the 30s you know, with no pensions and no benefits and making pennies a, a day, essentially, living in poverty, being told, you should be fortunate, you have a job. Well, if you didn't exist, someone else would exist. And we can go get a better job or a job somewhere else. So the rhetoric, it's fear mongering is all that it is. And it's, it's to make you all feel like you need to concede the pressure for you to concede to accept less is really what it boils down to. It's okay to pay a CEO I, $30 I feel... million dollars a year, upwards of $30 million. And for those of you who, oh, I've gotten this already. Well, I said upwards of $30 million. Well, they only made twenty four. What the F is the difference? It's because <laughs> when you get to that level, when you're $24 million, $26 million, $28 million, it's irrelevant. It's inconsequential. You're making an obs one person is making an obscene amount of money, while the people who actually make the company run and function are struggling to survive. And like you, you're going away from your family, and then look at what it's doing to your body. Look what it's doing to your body. And they don't, they seem to not care about that part. And to even just to, like I said, to support two households. First of all, the living in, in Michigan is uh, a, a different, such a different living. Like. Uh, the cost of living is just higher here uh, than it, I'm, I'm so surprised. That was sticker shock for me to come here and just see what rent was and what, what food costs up here. It's just, it's just, you wouldn't think it'd be so different, but it is. Um, even, even my cable bill is different with the same company, honestly, but to do that and to be able to maintain two homes, look, I, I just have a little simple Cape Cod back home. I don't have no fancy house. It's not nothing. You know, I have a simple apartment here in Midland, and I, ju I just do the best. Every year I still sit down and try to reduce the cost of something somewhere. I, sh I would probably still do that regardless of what I made, honest to God, because I'm just frugal. But I shouldn't have to. You know what I'm saying? Not being, I never thought that that would be the life for me as, a, as an automotive worker. When I first, when I walked in that door at sixteen eighty six an hour, I thought the sky's the limit here. I can only, it's only going to get better. I'm at the bottom and it's, I'm only going to go up from here, you know, and I waited a long time for that 30 time, I think I walked in at 32. So, you know, I'm going to be old when I retire. I'm not one of those that walk in at 18 and God love the ones that can walk in at 18 and retire at 58 or whatever. But for me, that's, that's not my plan. My body's only going to get worse. It's going to get more worn down and more beat up in time. And, uh, there's value to that. There's value to being away from my family. There's value that I have to make my own after GM life with, cause I don't have a pension. There's value to what we conceded to all along. And even, let me say, even when, when things turned around for me, uh, they capped me out at $19 an hour. When I was making that, when I started out that 14, I don't know if, if it was for one contract or for two, but I was capped at 19 and I couldn't go any more above that. And everybody else was about 28, but the people that were at 28, even when they brought me up, 
to that, those people that were $28 an hour still never got a raise, even with that contract. They said, here, okay, fine. We'll give, we'll give all you in, in progression people. We'll give you something, but we're not going to give the legacy people anything, anything. And even, also let me say this, when they brought me back to make $14 an hour, when they hired me on in 2008, I had different health insurance then too. Even though I was full-time, legit GM, I had to submit receipts for everything. that They gave me a little credit card for to cover my deductible. I had to submit receipts all the time for that. My deductibles were higher. Uh, everything was different for me. And when I, if you went to somebody and asked them, hey, what do I do with this? Nobody even knew how to handle health-related things. Like no, no union guy in my th They're like, we don't know anything about that. But it was just, so you were kind of, yeah, whatever. Here you go. Just come in when we'll figure it out later. You know what I mean? And I, no, no disrespect to the union people at, at my plant because this was all new to them. And, you know, when you go to them and say, hey, I'm having trouble with this getting paid, you know, they're like, oh, we don't know anything about it. We'll see what we can find out, you know. So even coming in, like I said, seven years, you come in $10 an hour less. Those concessions started way back then. I remember my first profit share in check not even 2000. It was, you know, but that's, that's when everybody was surprised. Oh my gosh, we're, we're starting to make money. Well, now we're making billions for this company. And, you know, wh wh when, when, when these, when these concessions were, were agreed to, it was only to be for a time. It was only to be until things got better. Just help us out. Just help us out. So I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, you know, we had your back. We did what we had to do. We did our part. And now we just want back what you took from us. And Chris had mentioned even before about uh, the July holiday. At my plant, when they gave you that two weeks off, it became, because we still did at my plant, we still did get our, our July shutdown. But one week was, was layoff and one week was a short work week because it was the 4th of July week. So we had that two weeks off, which we still got paid for. But then when we came back after the bankruptcy, uh, they took your vacation for that time. They stole that vacation from you. They forced you to take that week off and then said, you use a week of your vacation to pay yourself. And that's the way it is to this day. But most plants, I don't even know how many plants, if they still get shutdowns or not. Chris may know, but I don't. My Bay City doesn't. We don't get shut down. I've not since I've been there anyhow. And I've been there for four years, you know, but if, if I did get a shutdown, they would take my vacation and I would lose that week of vacation to pay myself instead of the short work week that we used to have or uh, unemployment benefits that would cover that. So uh, there's so much more behind the scenes. There's so much more to, to just specific to my Lordstown plant, uh, how they, we were we had a very strong union there, a very strong union. And I went back uh, through Facebook because I remember my vice president uh, mentioning um, something about we were just slated. that We were never he, – he had heard from uh, reporters and such in the Michigan area, Detroit area, that they knew they were never going to reopen or allocate. They came up with a new term because we had a contract. We had a memorandum of understanding that we would make the Chevy Cruze, I think it was till 2023. Uh, if we took concessions, if we made these concessions and took, you know, let's let's do this, let's do this. So our local union worked with them in those regards to keep the crews there for an extra five years. It initially was supposed to be done in 2019. And when 2019 rolled around, uh, they still closed it anyhow. So we had the memorandum that would have kept us open until 2023. GM says, okay, we'll do it. And then in 2019, they still stopped production, which I think was the goal all along. I think that that was planned. But uh, as far as I know, like, you know, they got tax abatements for that. GM had to pay all that stuff back. You know, now it's sold to Lordstown Motors and Foxconn and all that. I don't know. I, 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 that's a whole nother story in itself. But um, the vendetta that was against Lordstown was, uh, I think, as my – Vice President, then Vice President said, uh, was to destroy the Lordstown culture. All they did was send it out to the world now. You know, now that culture is in, is in well, yeah, but now, now that Lordstown, that strong union vibe is in Spring Hill and, 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 and uh, uh, Spring, or, uh, 
Wentzville, Missouri, and you got people that are on, you know, union committees there now making those unions even stronger or just com- just even contributing, you know, for them. So uh, 11, 12 live on. Uh, I'm a proud member. I'll always, that's my home. I'll always be a member of 11, 12, and I'm proud to be a uh, member now 362. So, but uh, 11, 12 will always be my, my home for sure. Michelle, has your wages at least matched what it was before the last year that you made the 23? So now I'm just where everybody else is. Yep. I'm level playing field with anybody else in the plant. Uh, I don't, you know, just whatever, you know, any full term, I guess it'd be eight years. Yeah. Any, any full term, full rate employee would be making. That's what I make now. But like I said, so that, that actually changed. I think that was, um, I'm not sure which contract it was, honestly, to tell you the truth, but we, I went from, I was capped at that $19 an hour and whatever contract it was, we rejected the first offer. And then GM came back with a second offer to jump all of us up to top rate at that point. So I've been at top rate. I don't, I can't, I can't even speak on which contract that was, but that's why my fight now for me, what hits home is for every temp for every in progression employee to not go through what I went through for not seven years of summer help for not seven years of full-time work at part-time pay. I, come on, you know, and that's really for me, like I said, that's, that's where my heart for me, you know, that's why I would stand on the line would be for those people that were where I was. Cause I hated it. It was hard, you know, and it was, it, it was just, it was just hard to, to, to make it, you know, through those times, you know, the highs are high and the lows are low and you're raising two kids and, and, you know, you got a family that you're trying to provide for, you know, well, well I'm glad I'm not working two jobs, which even at one point I still did when they were putting me through the layoff in 2008 to 2009, as soon as I heard I was getting laid off, I went, I went back to work at Staples, you know, because, because I don't know, I don't know what's happening. So every other week, the weeks that I was working at General Motors, I would work at General Motors and then a few nights a week, go back to Staples when I was done. And then on my off week, I'd work full time at that. You know what I mean? Because you don't know. You know, you just you just do what you can. And it's almost like fight or flight. You just you do what you can to to get to the next step. But I feel like that's kind of what this is. Is that what this strike should be about? I mean, it's fight or flight. This is it. It has to happen. Cause it's gone on for too long. You can't, you can't, uh, you can't say, Hey, I'm making 20 some million in performance bonuses. And then here, general motors, here's your 500 bucks performance. You know what I mean? Like, I know we get profit sharing, but my, my quality bonus or my performance bonus, whatever it is, I don't know, uh, 500 bucks, or whatever, you know? So I, I agree. She should make more money than me, Not but, that much more. <laughs> but come on. I just, I'm just trying to make a living. I'm just trying to make a living. I'm just trying to to provide, you know. And, and that's the thing. To... I don't think anyone argues that a CEO of a of a company the size of General Motors shouldn't get fair compensation. And you know, she's a sister, so I'm like right on. And she's the one who's paid the most. So I'm kind of like torn with this one when when it comes to her only because I'm like, yeah, right on. She she's a she's a woman. She made it. She's making more than the other the other two. But at the same time, it's like. Pay your employees, pay them their fair share of the success of this company. Y'all have back-breaking work. And I have family members who have worked for General Motors their entire lives. I have an uncle who was injured on the job, severely injured on the job that took him out. He became addicted to opioids. It destroyed his damn life. You know, so take care of your people. That's all that this is asking. That Nobody's asking for anything that is above and beyond. It is seriously allow us to, to to have a fair share of what is happening. Allow us to have a good life to where we don't have to struggle, where we don't have to be away from our families, where we don't have to travel nine hours to work. Who who does that? I, I think it's, it's unconscionable. The sacrifices are definitely great, especially, and I think uh, I'm a second shifter, but I choose second shift. I'm a night owl and I don't like to get up in the morning, but so many people are on that shift just by default and by low seniority, that's, that's a shift you're on. You, you get the worst shifts, but you have children, you have, you're missing, 
you know, you're missing football games and the first touchdowns and uh, the first words and of uh, whatever it is. I mean, you miss so much being on second shift, honestly, or even third shift, you know, because you're sleeping during the day. Honestly, the sacrifices that we all make um, to provide for our family compensation should be, you know, I don't know what part of what, what part of labor is the cost of the car, but I, I think I read between it's six small. and 10 percent. Honestly. Yeah, it's so small. And even if, geez, it shouldn't even be put on us that it's, it's our wages that are causing the cost of the car to go up. Because if we've only gotten three years over or three dollars over the last how many years, car prices have gone up over 30 percent in the same time frame. But my wages only went up three percent. So who's who's pocketing that other 27 percent? Because it ain't it, it ain't the guy missing his right. kid's football game. Right. You know, it's not him. So, I mean, that that's just my story. But the saddest part is, is it really is one of thousands. I know people who have who have moved away and have their parents have passed or they used to care for their parents. Their parents have passed away within just a couple months of them taking this other job or lost time with their brothers who passed away weeks after them moving. So many stories like that are just, that's the time that we will never get back. And that's the time that I'm faced with every day that I'm up here. And my sister makes a trip to Cleveland, an hour and a half drive to go get her chemo, to go get her treatments, to go see her doctors. How many times that's stuff I should be helping with. And while I am so grateful to be able to help and send money or buy dinner or something that I can do back home to help them out, time, I will never, ever, ever get that, that time back. Important. And that is worth, that is worth something. So where are we now, Chris? Like Sean Fain, I, I'm just, I'm going to just say this, thank goodness for him because he is, I think he's spectacular, quite honestly. I really do. I think he's doing what has needed to be done for decades, <laughs> decades. He reminds me of, you know, the, the people with the labor, the labor movement back in the day when all this started, um, you know, 90 years ago with you fighting for unions. Where are we today with this fight? What's going on? So we have to remember that there's always this common phrase you're going to hear with a lot of unionized labor um, it doesn't matter where you're at. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're with the IBEW. It doesn't matter if you're with the steel workers. I always say this phrase, as united we stand, divided we fall. And you're going to hear that a lot and with a lot of unions out there because it's a fact. And that's what has happened over the course of, I would say, the 16 years since the bankruptcy period. They started dividing our membership. And they did it by the wages. They started saying we have in progression, we have temps, we have seniority employees. They started dividing, and then there was started being some friction. And that friction was obviously between the difference of wage wages. And so what Sean Fain is doing, he's just bringing everybody together. Because, uh, you know, if I always look at, you, you always see that fist. People put their fists in the air. And, and I, th this is basically that the hand is representing the people, the different types of people. And when you put all those people together in a fist, they're a lot stronger when you punch somebody. And that's what we're basically, you know, we're all standing together with this fight right now. And where Sean Fain's at, where our negotiator are at, I got to hand it to the negotiators. Sean Fain is the, 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 the vocal of the of the UAW. He's a spokesperson. He is the perception. He is the front person you're going to see. He's the one that that represents us all and is being told to what to say, what to do from a group of our negotiators. That's where this is all deriving from. So it's just not Sean Payne. We have to be make make that very very clear. There is actually a group of of people that are right now they're sitting in front of the negotiators for GM, Salantis, and Ford. And they've been doing it since well back in April. And they were trying to figure out what we can do for our contract. This is what they've been doing. They're away from their families. They're, they're there from early morning to late morning 
trying to get a contract for us. So I got to hand it to our negotiators for sticking this out, for fighting for us. And because our decline of our membership went from 145,000 in GM to 40, 42 or whatever I stated earlier, 45, I think it was. 42.5, I think we said it was. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's 42.5. Um, because of that decline in membership, we've also had to reduce the amount of our international representatives down in Detroit at Solidarity House. And they've been combining their jobs just to keep us afloat. And that's what a lot of people don't know is that um, one of our own, and I, I'm not going to say his name because I just want, he, he knows that, he knows who, who he is. Um, I was down at a conference in February and I remember him talking to me and telling me, yeah, I got, they gave me a new job, Chris, you know, I thought I was moving up in the world. I'm really not. They said, oh, here's this job. And by the way, you still have your old job too. So this is our own international team that is even taking the cuts, even taking the hits and the punches that we're taking out on the floor. And they're saying, we got to do something because if it's happening at our own level at the UAW, at the highest level, you know it's happening on the floor back home. So he's taking this personally. You know, he's like, hey, I'm going to get this. I'm going to get this contract. I'm going to fight for these people with Sean Payne and his crew down there on the IEB board. They're doing their job. Where are we at? What are we going to do? I think what you're seeing on the in the media right now, I think it's a pretty good description of where we're at. Um, the EV. We got that language. We're looking good there. We're seeing the elimination of tiers or reduction of tier language. And that's helping us get the middle class rebuilt. That's getting people up to our wages. So we're getting that. We see that 20% or more increase in our wages. Maybe that could get bumped up some more. I think we can, we can live with a little bit more. I don't think there would be a, a big issue, but I can't speak for everybody. Mm -hmm. I know everybody was wanted that 46%. And they did. They came up with that number because that is really in the time that accumulated from the bankruptcy period. It's, it, it adds up to 46%. His math is spot on. Yeah. That's really what we're owed. Will they say something, you know, you know, they'll bring it down a little bit? Yeah, they might. They should because, you know, we don't want to 100% say we're so greedy. The UAW is greedy. We're not greedy. We're willing to negotiate. And he's already brought it down to 36%, if I'm correct. So I cannot say that we're greedy because he's already negotiating. That's what bargaining is all about. So we know the wages are in there too. Getting that job security is huge. It's bringing back the plants here in the state of Michigan and the United States. Look at Canada too. Canada just got a really good contract, a decent contract. And, you know, they're keeping some of that work there in Canada. We need to keep that work here in the United States as well. And and that's a big deal. The One of the biggest things that a lot of people are uh, are are having a hard time to deal with is the pension. Um, we would like to see an increase in the pension. We haven't had an increase in the pension in over, oh God, since 2003. So it's always stuck right at the amount that we're going to get right now. And it varies. And for some, it's not. <laughs> well, what was that? And for some, it's n they're not going to get a pension. Michelle, they're <clears throat> not going to get a pension. Right. And um, when we talk about pension and in progression, uh, employees, they're trying to even it out. They're trying to say in progressions are going to get a percent match to what they put in up to a certain percentage. So I see what they're trying to do. They're trying to get that up a little bit to get it close to what we get for our pension. So now they got that on the in progression, but they got nothing over here on the pension. So now they're trying to increase that. So it's even amount. And I think that's the hang up right now with some of our negotiators down south is we have to make it equal across the board. And that's that's what the UAW is all about. It's making sure that we're as equal as we possibly can. You know, it's funny when, you know, Michelle was saying about what they did to Lordstown and how they kept on giving and giving. Hey, we're, we're, we're willing to do this. We're willing to give you this. That that was a lot of the big threes, uh, I guess you could say their plan of attack to kill the middle class. 
you know, to reduce those numbers, to reduce the, the hourly employee, the union member, was to get plants to fight against each other. Yeah, that's true. It's called whipsawing. Yep. I don't know if you ever heard of it. That that was big, huge. Uh, even right here in Bay City, we lost some work here because we got whipsawed by another facility saying they could do it cheaper. That's and they bullshit. did it by bullshit. less employees, maybe combining jobs with this. And... Well, and then in 19, uh, they did the contract, and it, it may be even it may even happen in, in the previous contract. Um, they took that language, and they said, you can't do that no more. So whatever existing work that you currently have, you get the next generation of work. So that was a good thing from, uh, from our negotiators. From their standpoint, they did a great job with that language by saying, hey, we're not going to have our members fighting against each other to get work when they should already get that work and and so that that was a, a bonus that was a huge bonus and i thought that was really good but what's funny is that now what our negotiators are doing to these corporations they're doing exactly what they did to us they're whipsawing them against each other for uh for for our contracts so if We'll keep dealing with you if you give us a good contract. Well, look what Stellantis just got gave us over here. Well, now you got to meet with them. You got to give us what they gave us. So we're doing it right back. And like Michelle said, you know, we hear the whining, we hear the crying, the oh my God, you're why are you doing this to us? Wait a minute, you've been doing this to us for several decades. You know, you whips on us against each other. Now it's happening to you, and you're crying about it. <laughs> this is what it feels like. This is what we went through. You know, like I said, we had 1,400 employees when I hired. Now we're down to 300. And even before then, as we were growing up right here in Bay City, there was even a lot more. There was thousands. There was like almost like 8,000 people there at that plant at one time. Yeah. Yeah, so significant. do I really feel bad about what's going on? No, I don't. I, I think what Sean Payne and the IEB, the International Board, all of our negotiators, they're doing a great job. They're doing an excellent job. I fully 100% support my negotiators down there. They're the ones that know what our membership wants. They're the ones that are going to they're gonna keep fighting. And we have to be patient. It's hard right now because there is some division starting to happen, even in a small plant like ours. You got people that are, are I don't think it's about uh, picking sides. I think there's a little fear in there. I think there's a little, there's some people are scared, you know, like, man, what's going to happen? You know, are, are, we, gonna, are we ever going to get a contract? This is this we is on purpose, that. though. Like that's what, and and it's easy for me, someone on the outside, to say. But look at history. They're going to try to get away with giving you all as little as possible, and so they are going to push this out as long as they possibly can, because they also know that with pushing this out further and further, that more of you are going to do what you said. You're they're going to get start to get scared. They're going to start to want to concede. They're afraid they're going to lose their jobs. They're going to start to struggle because they're getting, the ones who are on strike are getting strike pay versus their full wages. It's a, it's a process. And, and the executives know this. Yes, and they, and they do. Their advantage. The it's one thing that I think that, that a lot of people don't understand is you push someone into a corner, eventually they're going to fight back. Now, we already got pushed in the corner already in 2019, and we weren't afraid. We, we, we stuck it out. Um, and when I, when I think about back in 19, uh, when we walked out, I had temps scared, feared. And I had to tell them, you know, I was, I was here I am on the, on the bargaining committee. I was in the leadership position. When I walked out that door, I actually told several of the temps that were working, as I want you to remember something, right now, it doesn't matter who I am. It doesn't matter what position I hold. It doesn't matter if I'm a machine repairman. 
It doesn't matter if I'm an alternate, alternate uh, bargaining representative. I am the same as you are right now. I am a union brother. We are out here together. We stood out there at 19 for 42 days. And we did it to make sure that there was a way in for temps to get hired in. We did it to get better wages for in progression. You know, there was a lot of fight to, to stop abusing our temps. Stop abusing these low-paying workers. Get them up to us. Now, what they ended up doing, of course, they made it a very it made it a very long process to get to us. We need to shorten that period down. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah. Shorten the period down. Let's get them up a lot quicker than ten years. It shouldn't take ten years to get to a full wage. It should Heck never no. take ten years. Heck no. You know it. It used to take three. So uh, when you were hired in, you got a one dollar raise every six months, and in three years you were up to top rate, just like everybody else. So, but there was there was no tiers. It wasn't a tiered system. It was just starting rate, and then you're up to max rate within three years. But you got a dollar raise every three months. We haven't had a we haven't had a dollar raise or every six months. I'm sorry, but we've we've had three dollars in how many years? You know, it used to be a dollar. And, and it's yeah. exactly what Michelle was saying. So that's what we're trying to do. Are we going in the right direction? We are definitely going in the right direction. I think, I think, uh, and it's just, like I said, it's just not Sean Payne. It's our negotiators that are all coming together from all three. All three groups of our negotiators are saying, this is what we're going to do. This is the goal. And we're going to make this happen. And they have. They have done their job. They have went above and beyond as of what I'm looking at right now. And with all the all the offers that have been on the table, they keep on getting and they keep on getting. They keep, there's going to be a time when they say, okay, we got all the check marks. Uh, a lot of our big executives down south, they have, they have their check marks, as I call it, their checks and balances, where did we offer our employees this? Check. They offered it, but they don't have to give it. They can say, okay, did we... Do we say, hey, we want your opinion about things? Okay, yep, we offered them to say their opinion, but did we get any action from those opinions? Yeah. A lot of times, no, no, we don't get that. We just were heard, but we weren't actually, the action didn't actually occur. Um, no, I can't say that about this local management because we have a different group of managers that are actually doing a, a, a pretty good above average job. I'm not going to say the greatest. I'm going to say above average um, because they are trying to um, look at everyone's uh, opinion about the work, the work that they do in the, in the plant and the environment that they work in and the conditions, and they continue to try to improve. So I cannot say that they're, that they're doing a bad job. I'm going to say they're doing an above, above average job. But as far as Sean Payne and negotiators are concerned, they are doing their checks and balances for the membership. So they're seeing A, B, C, D. Are we getting A, B, C, D? Did we get A, B, C? Yes, we did. Where are we at with D? We're not there yet. We need to keep pressing and pressing. And that's what they're doing. And the strategy right now with the UAW, I got to say it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. And it's, it's, it's showing its, uh, I guess it's, I don't know how to say this, it's, uh, it's causing the stress on them. It's, we are more endured, believe it or not. We can handle being out. We've done it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know about you, but I, the last time, when was the last time you saw any CEO or any of your high paying executives around a burn barrel? Right. You know, I want you to think about that. How many have you, I've never seen it. The only time I've ever seen it was in a movie with Eddie Murphy. <laughs> and, and that was the only time when I saw two executives lost their jobs from some law firm and they were in, they were bums on the street. That was the only, it was in a movie, mm -hmm. but I've never sight, I've never seen it in real life. I've never seen executives around a burn barrel fighting for what they should get. So fighting for what's fair. And that's what we're prepared to do that. And we're not, we're, and I got to hand it to all my GMCH, the CCAs out there. They're hanging in there. They've been there for since the beginning. Wentzville has been there since the beginning. You know, they're doing they're doing a phenomenal job. They're hanging in there. And right here in Michigan, we got Lansing Assembly that just went down. And that was one of the most recent ones. 
they're hanging in there. You know, uh, I I know that our negotiators down south are seeing this. They're going to understand this. This is the second go round for General Motors UAW members. This is our second time. So that we are not in uncharted territory. This is we're, we we are already prepared and trained for the rough waters. We know what it's like to have no money. We know what it's like to struggle with what we're getting with the strike pay. A five hundred dollar check to me, as far as strike pay, that's an improvement. I was on two fifty, if I'm right. If I think we only got two fifty, right, Michelle? I think we got we got two fifty in nineteen. And we made it on two fifty. You know, uh, we had we were buying we were getting groceries at the hall. They would get in bulk, so we would save money, oh, and people nice. would go over there, and we would actually get boxes of food, and you would take only what you need. Yeah. And we had we were getting anything from household goods to diapers and everything for kids and stuff. Uh, I remember having one, and, and people don't know this. You know, this is something that the I know the public doesn't know, is that I would take my strike team or my picket team. I would ask him, hey, how are you doing at home? What do you need at home? I need you to go over to the hall. Go, I would say, go grocery shopping. Get what you need. Don't just pile everything in a box because there are other people that are just as need as you are. No. And they would get the bare minimum to get through all this. And we did it. So for us to go on strike, bring it on. Yeah. Bring it on. We're ready. <laughs> We're not worried. You know? We had several several uh, areas in the community that would help out too, making donations or contributing food or bringing us food on the lines. Uh, honestly, the support from the community was behind us all the way there as well. So when you have that support, you got people driving yeah. by and they're honking and they're encouraging you. Uh, you're only feeding my fire. Uh, you're only letting me know that we're doing what we should be doing out there. And it isn't it isn't just about Michelle Howard or Chris Facundo. It is about everyone that's driving by. It's about every one of you that are fighting. And and even where the climate is now, the, the financial climate here where where you have people from from all all social classes yelling yeah. enough is enough. And you know, it's not just the auto workers, it's not just the subway worker. It is everybody who is sick from the waitresses on up. Everybody's just finally realizing, I don't know how all this came about. I don't know if that time at home with COVID when we were all shut down, I don't know what happened, but you know, it changed my perspective. So when you have the support of people behind you that are, you know, just encouraging you, they realize that we're not just fighting, excuse me, that we're not just fighting for us. We're fighting for them. We're trying to set the bar. And that just as I feel I deserve what I'm asking for, you should be deserving of the same thing. Does it get paid what you're worth? It's not, it's not just about your time. It's not just about, it's about what you know. It's about, it's about sacrifices. It's about time. It's about value that you're the, the millions and the billions that you're allowing this company making off the sweat of your back. You know, honestly, you know, I would challenge anybody to go work in my plant in the middle of summer with heated machines and hot machines. Come on, man. Uh, Michigan, Michigan summers, you know, they get up there and you're inside a plant that's probably 120 degrees and, you know, safety glasses are on and fans are sparse and come on, you know, uh, the sacrifice is really there at any time of the year, honestly. Uh, but to have the community support, uh, we're doing this for everybody. It's not just, it's not just a one man show. And credit to credit to yeah. COVID was a very it, that was probably one of the most challenging times uh, because if I remember uh, like what Michelle was saying about COVID, we were required to wear masks in the factories, and I don't know if anybody I, I would love to challenge anybody to do this to come in and into a plant that's uh, like she was saying you're talking upwards of ninety to one hundred degrees. So if it's 90 degrees outside, just add 10 to 15 degrees inside of a factory. That's what we were dealing with with COVID. So now you actually have to, you're forced to wear a mask on top of it. And you had to wear it properly. You cannot have it hanging down across your chin or just over your mouth. It had to be securely around your nose. So try breathing in that. And the safety glasses were terrible. I mean, they would fog up and you couldn't see anything. They tried doing the fog proof safety glass. That was another one. And we were considered, we were essential. 
for the economy to stay going. Uh, I mean, I was like one of the first ones. In fact, I believe I was part of the first people to come back, and I had to review all the safety measurements to make sure that it was safe for my district members to come back to work. Yeah. And and I was picking out as much as I could to say, okay, what are we doing this? Are we doing this? And they had to fix it before we said, okay, we can try it, but if there's any other measures that have to be fixed, that you got to get them fixed. And this was the bargaining team that, that stuck together when all this happened. And, I mean, this is us. We gave that up, you know, and, and that's when remote work came. If you remember remote, that's when all that, I, I can guarantee you at that time during COVID, uh, all of our hourly people had to be there because we had to run machines. We had to fix machines. Right. A, a lot of the higher positions got to stay at home and work from home from a computer. Okay, well, yeah, that machine's running. I don't have to go in there. I'll make a phone call. And it even started affecting your first line supervisors because they were like, why are they at home and I'm stuck here? And 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 you started they, they started getting a little frustrated. And, and wondering, is my life really that important? Or my life is like their life? You know, I'm making sacrifices. I'm making my own life here with COVID that happened, just like they are. So I'm just as non-valued as they are now. So they started seeing it. And there's some people that, that decided, I don't want to work for GM anymore. And they ran, they moved. They, they moved somewhere else. Well, I think COVID in general with what happened with the shutdown is people started, especially when it was divided and it was divided. This country was and still is divided where people were realizing that when you had a sect of the population who were usually your corporations, your executives, your far right politicians who were stating that y'all don't deserve any money and it needs to go to the businesses and not to the individuals, people started to really see the lack of value that these companies had for them and the level of wages that they were receiving are not sustainable. They're not living wages on so many levels. The top 10 employers in this country pay on average between 11 and $19 an hour. On average, the top 10 so you have you have this argument, you can just go get a better job. No, you can't because they're not there. Better jobs are not there. It's not happening. What, you're you're considering a dollar or two raise a better job when you're still below $19 an hour? It's disgusting. And so COVID, I think, really started to open up people's eyes. Like small business filings after COVID started to calm down, skyrocketed. I mean, it, it was insane because people were like, I, if I'm going to bust my ass and kill myself, I'm going to do it for my damn self. And I'm not going to do it for a company that doesn't value me. So a lot of that happened with COVID. I do think a lot of that. And there's a revival with unions in this country. And it makes me damn happy. Let me tell you, because I've been screaming this my whole life. I, you know, I just didn't come on this train. I have been talking the language that I talk my whole damn life. I come from working middle class. I've always annoyed everybody. I annoy people to this day, and I am never going to shut up about it. So, I'll give you another some another tidbit of information that I think you're going to find very surprising is our, our pension for the legacy employees. And I say legacy because we are the last dinosaur that's going to receive a pension as of right now. Yeah. Uh, and I understand where they're trying to get to where it's it's sort of equal with the in progression, the newer generation of employees. And if you seriously think about what they're doing, it's it is kind of smart in a sense because what they're doing is making sure that uh, people like Michelle and anybody that was hired in after two thousand seven, they have a protection with their their investment. They can if they decide not to work for Jenna Moore's. Their 401k goes with them. Right now, with me being 25 years vested, my pension does not go with me if I go. I have to get to my 30. So, and what happens with a lot of people that hired in at 18 years old back in the day, um, and I hired in when I was 28. So in 30 years, I'll be 58 years old. With the Social Security age that continues to go up, and they're requiring people to work longer, as they get older, uh, 
and nobody thinks about this, but with General Motors under their current pension program right now, is that if I were to retire at 58 years old, I don't get full Social Security until I'm 67. But I can start drawing at 62 years old. At 62, I only get 70% of my Social Security. What what our corporation does, and I hope this language changes in our in our contract that's being negotiated, is that we shouldn't be penalized if we're taking the early retirement because it's not early retirement. It's what GM is offering, it's 30 years. So you want me to retire in 30 years. Well, I shouldn't be penalized and lose 30%. I should, my supplement of what I get until I'm 62 should go to my 100% of my social security, it should go right to 67. You would get more people, number one, to retire, and you would get the younger people to start coming in this next generation, because now, if you're gonna continue doing what you're doing right now with the contract with the new in progression, we will, we will slowly leave, and these next generations that are gonna be given this, and I had, I have con I've got contracts here, old ones. This is the oldest one, and. Here's the new one. You can see the thickness. This is what we yeah. used to get. This is how thin it's already become. The contract for the newer employees, the new in progression, you make it lucrative, you're going to have them there. They're going to feel valued. They're going to feel like, hey, I don't want to leave GM. And it's going to be like we used to feel. I want to get into General Motors Corporation because look at the contract that we get with the company. The company loves us because they want us to work for us. They're going to give us a, a good 401k match. They're going to give us good insurance. Our wages are, are one of the top wages in the United States. That's how you get good employees. Right now, they're struggling to get employees. Yeah, they are. And it's because nobody wants you, to. Nobody yeah. wants to work for nothing. Well, they shouldn't have to work. It shouldn't even have to be a choice. It shouldn't I know Baskin Robbins right down the street. They get like 17, 18 bucks an hour part time. <laughs> we've had, even just within our own plan, we've had so many temps that have come in and have not even, have not even made it to their, I mean, they, they quit before they even get to, to full-time status, even before they get offered, you know, to move up to, to be on temporary part time. You know, they're, they quit so many of them have come in and out the door and listen, I got to tell you, this is an assembly line work. You know, this is just General Motors machines. You run the machine work, uh, but it's not tearing up your body like an assembly line uh, would, would tear it up. So I, I can't imagine the issues assembly plants must be having because if you have these issues here in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a plant that's not quite as physically demanding uh, as it is repetitive, nonstop, work in the chain work, you know, I, I just can't imagine. Yeah, they create you know, these honestly. scenarios where people are paid low wages. It's a difficult job physically, and people don't want the job. So they put it on the public and the worker that you're just lazy and not the fact that you're not compensating people for what you're asking them to give up and sacrifice. Now, there was, there was, a, there was a comment made by... Uh, uh, individual that we call them trolls on our on our way on our web page no. UEW International. <laughs> There's, we call them trolls because they troll in there and they make their little comments. You know, some of our operators, our production workers, and Michelle can attest to this. Yes, they will be sitting down because at the current time they're not cutting the part. The machine is. They're waiting for the part to be cut. So once that part is being cut or machine or doing whatever, they gotta wait. Then they'll get up, they'll get the parts, measure them, check for quality, and then it is it is actually whatever's in the program of the machine. So when you get an outside contractor coming in from whatever, Joe Blow um, um, heating and, and ventilation systems, you know, because they've contracted that, that work out too, in case you're wondering. Security's been contracted Everything out. Everything is. Uh, truck repair's been contracted out. You name it. Even our tooling's being contracted out. Mm -hmm. So when you see these people that are coming in and they see myself sitting down as a repairman or Michelle sitting down as a production, they're thinking, oh, that's all they do is sit around. <laughs> uh, uh, no, that's not the case at all. There's machines that are running and we have a certain procedure that we have to follow. It says 
I have to run so many parts at, at for let's say 50 parts. After 50 parts, I have to take three, four parts, run them through the gauges, run them through a check, a quality check, make sure they're good. This is what they do. This is that's part of the job. I mean, we're not we don't have a hammer and chisel and we're not cutting the stuff off the part to make the part. There's a machine that does it. And and that machine takes a certain amount of time to make those parts. So in defense to my production, all my members in production that are that are sitting there as our contractors see, oh my God, you know, these people are sitting on their butt. Uh, you don't know the process. You don't know what we're doing to make that comment. It'd be like me watching somebody that's working on a computer. All you're doing is looking at the computer screen. Yep. And me just look, it, it, they don't look at it from that way. No, I understand you're doing something on the computer. You're maybe fixing a line program or whatever that I don't know what you're doing. So how can an outside contractor or outside people say, oh, yeah, all they do is sit on their butts yeah. when they don't know really what they're doing? No. So <laughs> I find it kind of offensive. Yeah, it's so typical of today, though. Everybody has an opinion, but nobody's educated on what the hell they're talking about, you know? <laughs> so Yeah, I hear you. Oh, my goodness. So, so the fight continues. How many of you are on strike right now? Um, I know it changes. I believe you right now it went up to thirteen. I think it's thirteen thousand. I believe. I think that was it was close to around thirteen. I think that was the last count that I had seen. And like I said, we're not. I know GM, all of my GM UAW brothers and sisters out there right now, they're not afraid. Good. We're not afraid. If they, if Sean Payne says, "Hey, um, hey, Bay City, it's time for you to walk out." Hey, okay. Uh, uh, we're ready. We've done it. We're trained for it. We we weathered the the storm in nineteen. We we were out in freezing rain, wind, cold, and so it's not it's not something that we haven't done and we're not prepared to do again. And I gotta hand it to all my like I said my, my all my sisters and brothers down in Wentzville and Lansing, and all the GMCH and CCAs. Um, they're hanging tough in there. GMCH and CCA, by the way. They don't, uh, they, they weren't at, they didn't get the top wage that we got in this contract. That's one of the big accomplishments of our negotiators down in Detroit, that if this contract goes through, they're going to be up to our wage. And that is a monster accomplishment. We've been trying to get that for years. And to see that happen, as I got to hand it to our negotiators for taking that, putting that on the table and saying, bring them up too. They need to follow us too. We all need to be on the same level, the playing field. And and I and I love what they're doing. I continue to support them. I want to see. I think this contract is close. I think it's close, even though the media says something different. The media wants the public to feel bad for these CEOs and for the exactly. corporations. Yeah. Oh, boo hoo! Exactly. You know, I'm crying. That's what they're doing. Oh, they I know what the they're jobs doing. Jobs away if they're too greedy. Blah 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 blah. Yeah, it's yeah, the same yeah. old and, propaganda and, rhetoric. Yeah, and that's why I laugh. I goes, I always crack up at him, and uh, and and I'm not really too concerned. I'm like, okay, go ahead. I think the public really is starting to realize that there is a movement going on. It's a huge social movement, just like my chairman said. It's to get the rebuild that middle class, get everybody back up to a, a, a good living wage, a decent living wage uh, uh, to where they can enjoy their life and Absolutely. and retire and enjoy their life. That's what's going on. Absolutely. And, and we're going to continue fighting. And I think most of the, I, I just read an article, I think it was about a week ago, where a majority of Americans, thank goodness, support the UAW. So that makes me happy because the labor movement in this country needs to ha needed to happen people needed to start standing up and fighting for what everyone's value and worth is again and these astronomical profits and people are struggling to survive is not okay it's not okay well i thank you both for for joining uh me today i've been wanting to talk about this for so long <laughs> I'm happy to finally get. Well, thank you. you for inviting us. Yeah, I'm happy to get you on here. I am going to have a ton of links in the show notes for everybody with resources. The story of Lordstown. There's it's a, for those of you who don't know, it's horrible. The story of Lordstown. 
And um, the statistics and the, the links to the website for UAW, where people can get all kinds of information from there. Yeah, UAW, UAW.org. That, that's the website, UAW.org. And uh, you can look up what Sean Payne has been talking about and, the, and our negotiators have been talking about all along. It's, it's 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 there for anybody to see, and they can see what our contract states, even our previous contracts. I also encourage people to look up the corporations. Just take a look at the investment part of it. Uh, GM, look at GM.com, and you'd be very surprised at what your your the investor portion of it under the proxy statements. I've been really vocal about that to a lot of different people. Because they would be very surprised at what the top five people that they showed. They made seventy million dollars just with five people. Yeah. That's what the that was what they were paid. It's obscene. It's obscene. And I'm sorry, but I, I I don't understand I don't understand where the 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 fight of actually giving us something that you should have gave us a long time ago. But when somebody gets a half a million dollars for transportation or I guess you could say um, that's one of their perks, uh, a half a million dollars. Uh, I, I, I see something wrong with it. So yeah. I encourage people to look at investment parts. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys again. Thanks, Sarah. Glad to share a story. The following two paragraphs are direct language from the UAW General Motors modifications to 2007 agreement and addendum to VEBA agreement, V-E-B-A. It is a message to UAW members at GM dated May 2009. Quote, Dear brothers and sisters, as we all know, General Motors is suffering through the most severe crisis it has ever suffered. The company has experienced unprecedented losses and $15 billion of federal loans have already been necessary to keep the corporation afloat. U.S. auto sales are at a 40-year low, and GM will not make it through its downturn without additional government assistance. Faced with this dire situation and realizing failure to meet the government requirements would surely mean the end of General Motors, your bargainers painstakingly put together modifications to the collective bargaining agreement to satisfy the Treasury Auto Task Force, end quote. And concessions they did make. From pensions to health care to a complete stop of COLA, the cost of living increase. There is a long list of concessions over 14 pages listed one after the next. And it was in this addendum when temporary flex employees were introduced as a quote unquote new category of employee. As you heard in this podcast, these employees have become the default type of employee within GM because they literally do not pay them any benefits unless they quote unquote meet all eligibility requirements, but they are not given the opportunity to do so for upwards of eight to 10 years. Fast forward one year to the end of 2010. GM made a 4.7 billion with a B dollar profit. CEO at the time, Daniel Ackerson received 2.3 million in total compensation. UAW workers received nothing back of what they sacrificed the year before to help save the company. In 2011, GM posted its largest profit to date at $7.6 billion, and Ackerman was paid $7.7 million in compensation. UAW workers received none of their concessions back. And GM also had the audacity to complain that year in a government filing that Ackerson's and other executive pay was not competitive because, quote-unquote, government restrictions stopped them from recruiting top talent. Well, GM made up for it in 2012. They raised Ackerman's salary by a staggering 44% to $11.1 million with profits of $4.86 billion, a $2.7 billion drop from profits in 11. But Ackerman got a raise. UAW workers, still none of their concessions back. From 2013 to 2022, CEO pay at the big three companies has jumped by over 40%. And the company has paid out nearly $66 billion with a B in shareholder dividend payments and stock buybacks. Those concessions that the UAW workers made to help save the company way back in 2009? Nothing. Not even COLA. In fact, across the U.S., auto workers have seen their average real hourly earnings fall 19.3% since 2008. 
the global auto industry today is valued at about $3 trillion, give or take a few billion. Of that, 15 companies control 66% or roughly 1.9 trillion US dollars. 2022 CEO compensation for these 15 is staggering. I'm going to run through them really quickly for you. Mitsubishi, 1.7. Honda, 2.9. Geely, 4.2. Renault, 6.3. Toyota, 6.9. Nissan, 9.5. BMW, 10 mil. Volkswagen, 11.3. Ford, 21 million. Stellantis, 24.8 million. GM, 29 million. Hyundai, 54 million. Tata Motors out of India, 1.2 billion annual compensation. And Tesla with Elon Musk, a $54 billion pay package, while the average employee at Tesla makes $34,176 per year. And who really knows what the hell is going on at Tesla? This $3 trillion value is not created by CEO or executive action. Without the labor of the workers, these companies are worthless. No CEO, not Elon Musk, not Mary Barra, not Jim Farley have ever invented anything in their lives. Everything about the product of their company is ideated, designed, and fabricated by legions of workers ranging from the African slaves that mine the lithium used in EV batteries to the ununionized East Asian factory workers that make their parts to the American factories and engineering firms that design and assemble the final vehicle. The only input they have is pressing the green button to fund a project from their multi-million dollar homes. There is a reason John D. Rockefeller is still the richest man in American history. It is the union of organized labor that ended his age of monopoly. Where adjusted for inflation, one man could be worth $306 billion, while the average worker made $349 a week working 14-hour days in brutal, body-destroying conditions. It is unionized labor that brought us the 40-hour work week, paid time off, health care, job protections. What the striking UAW workers are asking for should be the standard for every working person in this country and the world. The lazy unionized worker is a mythic caricature invented to divide us working people, to distract us from those at the top who live lives of opulence on the dime and backs of our future and our children's futures. U.S. auto companies have the means to invest while paying their workers a fair share and still earn healthy in the billion profits. They simply do not want to. You will find links to a plethora of resources from this podcast in our show notes. Do you love our podcast and online content? Then you'll love our monthly print magazine plus five bonus magazines even more. Subscribe Plus 5 offers amazing adventures, stunning photography, and high-profile content you won't find in our free online magazine. Plus, you receive automatic entry into our monthly Spend Local Michigan and surprise pop-up giveaways where you have a chance to win a monthly Made in Michigan goodie box and other awesome prizes like GoPros, kayaks, outdoor gear, and more. Subscribe Plus 5 today at livelovelocalmi.com.